So I think the easiest bit to kick this off would be his video about repentance and what repentance means. I'm going to show you why this is a good place to start. Now, in my experience of dealing with different Gospels out there and everybody's different points of view, whatever persuasion of Christianity they're from, even though they all disagree on the specifics like the sacraments and this, that and the other, they all agree on repent of your sins to be saved. So my experience has taught me always look out for that because if you can find that out, then the chances are pretty high that there's a false gospel in there somewhere. Okay, even if at, at, at first they might seem like they're giving lip service to faith alone. Now I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time dealing with repentance. It's just a very good entry point because obviously repentance, whatever it means, it's, it's when someone starts their Christian journey. And so understanding his starting point will then understand why uh, everything else that he says about Osas and faith alone is false. So if you want more information on the repentance issue, I have done a video titled Repentance for Salvation, Biblical Salvation Settled Once and for All. And it's it's almost seven hours long. It's a very, very long video. I've gone into so much detail and that's why I'm only going to be very brief about it here because I've already done the homework on this. Okay. So here, he's going to introduce this video about this false teaching about repentance that's out there that loads of people are teaching. So just have a look at this. There are many false teachers out there teaching that repentance does not mean turning from sins. These people are ravenous wolves who will get you if you don't know any better. They're reprobates and they're dangerous men and they need to be avoided at all costs. They'll say that repentance just means to change your mind about who Jesus is and believe in him and that you don't have to repent of sin. So he introduces this video essentially saying that there are all these people out there, which he includes me in, in his category of false prophets, teaching that repentance doesn't mean turning from sin. OK, so there's all these false people going around saying that repentance just means to change your mind about who Jesus is. It doesn't mean turn from all of your sins. Well, this what's so laughable about this, folks, is if, if there are all these people saying that, I want to know who they are and where they are because I can't find them because the vast majority of Christians think that repentance means to turn from your sins to be saved. Just ask most Christians if they believe that. That's what everybody believes. This is the phrase that's been parroted by most famous preachers. Repent of your sins to be saved. So no, there aren't loads of false people going around saying this. There are a handful of people here and there saying this. And what's so laughable about this, folks, is that I did a 15 minute clip on my channel, Repent of Your Sins to be Saved Heresy Montage, where I included him saying that same thing, that there's all these false people teaching that repentance doesn't mean from sin. I've included that in a 15 minute video that's just full of loads of different preachers and well-known YouTube channels and well-known theologians and Christian preachers all saying repent of your sins to be saved over and over again, whatever persuasion of Christianity they're from. So people like Leonard Ravenhill, Paul Washer, Charles Lawson, Billy Graham and Franklin Graham, Ray Comfort, Tim Conway, Jesse Morell, somebody that he yokes up with called Hal Chaffee, Francis Chan, although he doesn't quite use the lingo, but he essentially believes it. You've got Mike Schmitz, who's a Roman Catholic. He says repent of your sins to be saved. Bible Flockbox is a well-known, uh, very popular YouTube channel. He's a Seventh-day Adventist and he believes in repent of your sins to be saved. I even got a clip in this video of Joel Osteen saying repent of your sins. And so folks, there aren't loads of false preachers going around saying that repentance doesn't mean turning from sin. There are loads of false preachers going around saying that repentance means turning from sin. That's what majority of Christians believe. And I know that because even when you go out soul winning and you ask these Christians, do you believe it's faith alone? Yep. Yep. Do you believe, you know, it's a gift? Yep. Yep. Do you believe that repentance means turn from all of your sins? Yep. Yep. That's what most Christians believe that I bump into folks. The false definition of repentance that's so rampant in Christianity is the one that says turn from your sins to be saved. And funnily enough, the Bible never says the, the verbatim phrase, repent of your sins. The Book of Mormon says it plenty of times though, folks. And I demonstrated that in my Repentance for Salvation video. So we'll just keep listening to him bang on about repentance some more before we get to the definition of what it really is. And yes, it's true that the Greek word for repent is metanoia, which just means to change your mind. But the question is, change your mind about what? Well, the, it's to change your mind about sin, and I'm going to prove that to you today. But now the first objection some will have is that, well, the book of John doesn't mention repentance even once. 
But this is an absurdly ridiculous way of studying the Bible. And let me show you why this is such poor reasoning. I could say, well, the book of John doesn't mention the word sovereignty even once. So are we to assume that John didn't believe in God's sovereignty? No, we would never say that. Well, John also didn't mention anything about God being omniscient or omnipotent. So are we to say that John didn't believe that God was all knowing or all powerful? No, this is foolishness. But this is exactly the sort of games that people try to play with the word of God. And not even to mention that John wrote four other books in the Bible, and he most certainly mentioned repentance from sin in the book of Revelation numerous times, as I'm about to show you. So just a bit of background to the argument that he was dealing with about John's gospel not mentioning repentance. It comes from John 20, 31, and it says, But these are, are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And so essentially, John's gospel is the one book in the Bible that's written specifically to tell you how to have eternal life. That's why it's written, okay? Now, I, I did answer this logical conundrum in my Repentance for Salvation video, so uh, please do check it out if, if you want more information about this, but we'll be brief here. So, John's Gospel never mentions repentance one time, so if, if repentance means turning from sin, and the book that's written to tell us how to have eternal life doesn't mention it, then presumably we don't need to do it for eternal life. That's what a lot of faith alone advocates might say. But then he answers that by saying that the same John who wrote that gospel also wrote the book of Revelation and mentioned repentance multiple times throughout the book of Revelation. Okay, so we can't just say that we don't need to do it when other books do tell us to do it. And obviously not just the book of Revelation, but the other gospels and the book of Acts as well. And then it sounds like he's making a reasonable argument because he further qualifies this by pointing out that John's gospel never mentions God's sovereignty or his omnipotence, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't have those qualities. So it sounds like quite a reasonable argument at first. But the, the problem is, though, is that this issue here of, you know, if it's something like God's sovereignty, well, this deals with facts about God or just something that is true, not not something that's an instruction. Now, we can't expect facts to be repeated in every book, otherwise the Bible would be far too big, it would be far too repetitive, or it could only have one book in it. So obviously, if, if one book says God is this or God is that, we don't expect another book to have to repeat it for it to be true. Absolutely, that is correct. But the problem is when we when we turn to the issue of repentance, though, we're no longer dealing with facts or truth so much as we're actually dealing with instructions that you have to do for a particular purpose to be carried out. That's the difference, okay? And that's where his reasoning starts to crumble. So we have quite a serious problem here because the bottom line is we need to know what instructions we must do to be saved onto eternal life. This is too important to not know this. We have to know how, how this can be achieved. Now, John's Gospel is the only book in the Bible that specifically declares itself to be written for this purpose. No other book in the Bible makes that claim, okay? Let me give you a visual illustration to try and make my point simple. Let's suppose I asked you to build this car, okay, this Lego car, and I gave you s some instructions and said, here you go, get on with it. Well, you would probably expect that as soon as you see instructions like this, you open the cover and it starts at what you must do first. So the first page, step one, have the right parts, put the simple bits together first, then step two on the next bit, and then after that on the next page, step three, and then step four, and so on. Now, if I instead gave you instructions where you have to scroll all the way down here for step one, and then all the way up here for step two, and then all the way down here for step three, and then all the way down here for step four, and then back up again, and then it didn't have any numbers on it either, you would be so confused as to how to assemble this. You would not you would not have any idea at all. And everybody, if I asked multiple people to do this, everybody would just end up in a complete mess because nobody would know what instructions to follow. Okay, a simple set of instructions should go in a nice, sensible order. Now let's say that I asked you to build this car, but instead the instructions I gave you were this desk. Well, again, we have the same problem as if, it, if, as if the steps didn't go in order. You wouldn't be able to use these instructions to make a car. Now, if I asked you to make a desk, these would be very helpful instructions, but to make this Lego car, they're not going to help you at all, okay? So, it wouldn't be very fair on me to give you instructions that either you can't just read in a sensible order, 
or I give you the wrong instructions that aren't written for the purpose of which I'm asking you to do. I, I hope you see my illustration there. Now, the problem with EPUC on apologetics, and indeed anybody with a false salvation, is that they read the Bible like this, like a convoluted conspiracy board with post-it notes all over the place. And it's all like, well, over here he does say believe, yes, so we can see that we need to believe. But then all the way down here he mentions baptism. And then all the way over here someone talks about denying self. And then all the way over here someone talks about walking in the spirit. And all the way up here someone talks about church discipline. And all the way so over here. And so this is how they read the Bible. And so everybody that has a false salvation ends up with their own version of what works we need to do or how we even know what we're saved because nobody can read the Bible like this, okay? It doesn't even make sense to anybody to read it this way. And, and this is why people get confused with works-based salvation. And so how is John's gospel written? Well, it, yes, yes, it is written to tell you how to be saved, but strictly speaking, it's not written in the same way as the Lego instruction manual that I showed you, okay? A gospel is a written testimony or a written account, if you like, of different things that Jesus said and did in conversations that he had with specific people. Now, over and over again in John's gospel, Jesus told people to believe on him. That happened in multiple occasions to multiple different people. But in, in his conversation with Nicodemus, he never told Nicodemus or even he never told the woman at the well to get baptised or join a fellowship or to take communion or deny themselves or turn from their sins. So if you take those conversations as the isolated conversations that Jesus had with those specific people, he didn't talk about those things. OK, and even in a similar manner, like in Acts 16, the prison keeper asks a very clear question. What must I do? to be saved. Okay, that's a, a simple question and it, it needs a good answer. Well, all the apostles said to him was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Now, yes, they did baptise him later, but baptism wasn't included in the instruction, though. It wasn't the reply to the question. It was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Again, no mention of fellowship, no mention of turning from all of your sins, no mention of getting baptised or, or taking communion or any of that kind of stuff. And so herein lies the problem. If you absolutely insist that getting baptised and turning from all of your sins and walking in the spirit and picking up your cross daily and all that kind of thing are necessary components of the gospel, you have to accuse Jesus and the apostles of not preaching the gospel correctly to multiple people multiple times. Now you can say, well, yes, but over here, Peter tells the church to do such and such. Yes, but that's not what Jesus told the woman at the well, and she needed to know how to have eternal life. And that's what John's gospel is written for. And so furthermore, you then have to accuse John of writing a useless book, really, that didn't fulfill the purpose for which it was written. If turning from sins is so important, for example, Jesus should have mentioned it to multiple times in John's gospel. Now we hear these repent of your sins type preachers talk about it all the time but for some reason we don't see Jesus talking about it even though it's supposed to be really really important. Now someone might then reply to me and say something along the lines of well wait a moment because J didn't Jesus say sin no more in John's gospel also so isn't that then something we have to do for eternal life? Well yes he did say it in John's gospel he said it to the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8 and the lame man at the pool of Bethesda whom he healed that was in John chapter 5. However in those isolated conversations that Jesus had with those specific individual people, Jesus never mentioned believing on him, and he never mentioned eternal life. Now, if, if sinning no more was such an important component of eternal life and salvation, Jesus should have joined these things together if it was such an essential component, but, but he didn't. He didn't connect those things with eternal life itself because it's just, it's not the context of the conversation that he had with those people. Now, I'm not going to play the rest of the video. Um, to summarise, the points that he's going to make from here on are that he, he's been confronted with an example where God repented, and that was that um, God repented of making man that was going to flood the earth. But his argument is that there are plenty of other examples where repentance does mean turning from sin, though. So just because it doesn't, in the Genesis example, doesn't mean that that's not what it generally means. And he'll point to, like, Simon the Sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, for example, or the letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. So the, the problem isn't exactly that what he says is entirely wrong. The problem is that how he applies it and then he then makes it about salvation when repentance for salvation is not the same thing as repenting for sin.
Now, it is true that sometimes repentance does mean turning from sins, absolutely, but not in every context. Now, and he's already pointed it out in his video, but he did miss these essential points. Now, Simon the Sorcerer in Acts chapter 8 already believed and was baptised before he was told to repent. Moreover, he was not told to repent of all of his sins. He was told to repent of a specific wickedness. Okay, so this is not turn from all of your sins that thou shalt be saved. He already believed this was a specific wickedness that he as a believer needed to turn from. Okay, when Jesus told several churches to repent in Revelation as well, he, he did not tell them to turn from all of their sins to be saved. These were churches, so they were already believers. He wasn't preaching to the unsaved or trying to win the lost. These were already established churches of believers. And it, again, it was specific sins in different churches that he told them to repent of, not turning from all of their sins. OK, so to wrap up this point, then, what about repentance specifically for salvation? So you might think of I have not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. Or there is more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than a righteous man who needs no repentance. Or unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish when he described a city that was full of sin. Uh, John the Baptist, for example, preached repentance for the remission of sins, as did the apostles in Acts. Now, that last one there is crucial because I think if you can understand that last one, all of that will start to make sense. So uh, I think the best place to prove this would be Matthew 21. Now, uh, bearing in mind, I have started th verse 31 a little bit later. There's a bit I've chopped off because before that, Jesus does use a parable where he does explain about doing the will of the Father, which uh, people like Epiusion would try and abuse and make it about work salvation. I'm not going to deal with that right now. I'll just try and finish off this repentance issue so that we can move on to Osas. And then if I have more time towards the end, I can come back to some of those passages as sort of a miscellaneous thing. So I might be able to deal with that parable later. I'm not going to deal with it right now. So Jesus said unto them, it says in uh, 2132, Verily I say unto you that, and watch this, the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Now, what are the publicans and harlots? Well, we know from, we, we know harlots, certainly, but we know also about the publicans as well, that these are types of sinners. Okay, because harlots, obviously, that, that's somewhat obvious. Publicans, the Pharisees, like when they asked Jesus, why do you hang around with sinners when he was talking to the to the publicans? So the publicans and harlots, they're types of sinners, and they go into the kingdom of God before you, which you can just make that uh, equivalent to heaven, if you like. Well, then the question is, why? Okay. Why do they go into the kingdom of heaven before you? Bearing in mind that Jesus is talking to the chief priests and Pharisees. Okay. Well, John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and watch this, you believed him not. Okay. But then it says the publicans and harlots believed him. So notice it doesn't say turned from their sins. Okay. That's not what it says. It just doesn't say that at all. It says they believed him. And you, when you had seen it, watch this, repented. So there's that key word there. Not afterward that you might believe him. So according to Matthew 21, 31, uh, sorry, 21, 31 to 32, what is the repentance that the chief priests didn't do that the publicans and harlots did? Well, it's quite simple. It doesn't say that they turned from being harlots or turned from their sins as publicans. It says that they believe him. That's the repentance. Now, just in case someone says that's not specifically the repentance that John actually preached, though, you know, maybe John did still tell them to turn from their sins when he preached repent. Well, just to further qualify that, Acts 19.4, this is Paul. Then said Paul, John verily baptised with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, well, what, what did he say unto them? that they should believe on him which is to come after him. So again, no mention of turning from sins. It's believing on him. That's the repentance that John preached. John preached that they should believe on the Christ that was to come after John. The publicans and harlots, types of sinners, believed him, that they did repent. Whereas the, the chief priests and Pharisees, they did not repent. They did not believe. Okay, so repentance for salvation is to believe on Christ. 
And just to further qualify that, Acts cha uh, chapter 2, verse 38, this is another repentance go-to, turn from your sins verse that they use. Peter says, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So again, they assume that when Peter said, repent there, that he meant to turn from all of your sins. The problem with that, folks, is that again, look what follows the repentance after repentance there's baptism okay so they get baptized after uh, they repent and then they get baptized and then uh, they do that for the remission of sins and then they shall receive the gift of the holy ghost and these are the key points this is what follows the repentance that P peter was preaching whatever he meant by that well if we compare scripture with scripture we can point baptism to let's say mark 16 16 where it's he that believes on him and is baptized so again it doesn't say he that turns from his sins and is baptized he that believes on him or also you could go to acts 38 36 to 37 and it says and they as they went on their way sorry shifted it a bit there they came onto a certain water and the eunuch said see here is water what does hinder me to be baptized so What's stopping me from being baptised, he asks. And Philip says, well, have you turned from all of your sins? Oh, wait, no, he didn't say that, folks. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you can, you may, you may be baptised. So we see from comparing Acts 2 with Mark 16 and Acts 8 that baptism follows belief. It doesn't follow turning from sin. And then what about the gift of the Holy Ghost? Well, well then we can point to John chapter 7, 38 to 39. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which, watch this, they that believe on him should receive. So we see that baptism follows belief, according to Mark 16 and Acts 8. We see that the Holy Spirit follows belief, according to John 7. So that's the repentance, once again, that Peter preached about. If it's referring to salvation, it's to turn from not believing the gospel or from not believing on the Christ to believing on Christ. That's the repentance that Peter preached about. That's the repentance that John preached about. So that's all I'm going to say on that for now so that we can move on to OSAS. If you want more information, again, as I mentioned earlier, look at my Repentance for Salvation video. There's seven hours of material there almost. So a good place to start on OSAS would be his video on John 10, 28, where he's going to refute one saved, always saved, because John 10 is probably one of our best or first go-to passages on eternal security. So naturally, this is one that we're going to head with first. So he's obviously got to answer it and try and refute it. Now, I'm not going to play large chunks of the video because as much as I do want to prove all things and show that I'm not making stuff up, I, I like to show what he's actually saying. But unfortunately, if I show everything that he says, my video ends up becoming ridiculously long because it's got to be at least as long as everything he says plus what I have to say. So I'll just show you his introduction for about 25 seconds and then we'll just quickly run through the transcript to see everything else that he's saying. One of the top verses that people use to support Once Saved, Always Saved is John 10, 28. And this is so frustrating to me because they've taken what was meant to be an assurance for a committed follower of Jesus and they've turned it into something that it's not. They turned it into an assurance for somebody who has either walked away or is not walking with Christ. And that was never what it was meant to be. And I'm going to prove that to you. So the way that he's going to frame this argument is that when it says no one will snatch them out of my hand, that doesn't just mean any any single person that ever comes to him. There's a, a specific condition that's involved here. Now, he'll explain that condition by quoting the previous verse uh, 27 where it's Jesus says my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me so he emphasizes the word follow and underneath that that includes you turning from all of your sins all that kind of thing all of that is encapsulated in following him it's not it's not just believing in him there's more to it than that, that that's the premise of what he's saying he then goes on to further explain that uh, when it says no one will snatch them out of my hand, people will tell him that that includes oneself, but then he refutes that because his argument is you cannot 
snatch yourself. You can snatch something else or you can snatch other people. You just, you can't snatch yourself though. Okay. So he's saying that this can't apply to you walking away from the faith, essentially. And he goes on to further qualify that from an earlier verse, verse 12, where it says that it's the wolf that snatches them and scatters them. So if someone loses their salvation, it's not that they're snatching themselves, rather the wolf can snatch them. But in order for the wolf to snatch them, they've already had to leave Jesus. They must not be following him anymore. That's the, that's what how he's framing the argument. So then he goes on to give a visual illustration. There's these sheep there. There's Jesus. Jesus is protecting the sheep and there is a wolf. But so long as they're following the shepherd, they're OK. The shepherd's going to protect them. But then if the sheep stops following the shepherd and walks away, wanders away, then the sheep is, is, is no longer under the shepherd's protection. And so now they're vulnerable to the wolf snatching them. And then he'll go on to explain where people might bring up the ish, the uh, parallel kind of issue from Luke 15, where Jesus talks about the lost sheep out of the hundred that leaves the 99 and Jesus will will go back for his sheep. And so he interprets that as being a sinner turning back to Jesus. That That's how he interprets that. So we're, we're going to break down the reasoning that he's using, because what I find is the arguments or the way that he's trying to frame how this works doesn't really align with the way that Jesus framed it in, in the Gospels. So at the beginning of John chapter 10, this is where Jesus introduces this theme of uh, the sheep and, and the shepherd. And it is in the context of salvation because uh, a few verses later, he's going to mention eternal life. That is the overall subject of what he's talking about. He just doesn't say that straight away when he introduces this this concept and he's giving them this parable, if you like. So uh, what it, first of all, it establishes the... Uh, the fact that Jesus is the true shepherd. He he enters by the door, whereas uh, other people who will try and get in are thieves and robbers. Okay. So uh, Jesus is, is the legitimate way in, if you like, which there's not really any controversy there. And then in verse three, so what we see here is that the sheep hear his voice. And it also says that he calls his own sheep by name. And he leads them out. And you could say um, he leads them out of the sheepfold mentioned in verse 1. So they were in the sheepfold. Uh, thieves will try and break him, but only the shepherd can go through the door. And he will lead the sheep out because they follow his voice. They don't follow the thieves and the robbers, if you like. They they know the voice to, to follow. And then when he puts forth uh, his own sheep, it says in verse 4, he goes before them and his, his sheep follow him for they know his voice okay so what you'll notice so far that this is kind of a one-way uh relationship in this in the sense it's one dimensional is what i mean the shepherds leading the sheep the sheep follow him okay it's fairly one dimensional now it says in verse five a stranger will they not follow but will flee from him for they know not the voice of strangers. So if anybody tries to lead the sheep away from the shepherd, they simply will not follow him. Okay. Now I'll just change that there to one dimensional so it makes a bit more sense. So then Jesus goes on, uh, it goes on to explain, sorry, in verse six, that they didn't understand the parable that Jesus spoke. And then Jesus goes on to say in verse seven, I am the door of the sheep. So in, instead of using the word shepherd, now he's using the word door and he's about to get onto the crux of the matter, salvation. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep the sheep did not hear them. Okay, this is another crucial bit. So all the people that are trying to break in and get the sheep, which you could say false prophets with their other truths or their other religions or their other ways into heaven, if you like, the sheep didn't hear them. The sheep heard the voice of the shepherd. Jesus goes on to clarify this meaning of being the door. So I am the door. It, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And notice that this is the condition here. This is the if, okay? Because Epiusion likes to point all the ifs out. It says, if any man enter 
in. So it doesn't say, if he follow me wheresoever I goeth up here, down there, left, right. I go all the way over there, I go all the way down here, they will follow me and they will do as I say constantly throughout the entire journey. That's not what's being said here. It's simply, if any man enter in. Because what Epiusion does is he turns salvation into a path when actually Jesus is just making it an entrance. A door is just something you walk through the door. As soon as you go through the door, you find pasture, it goes on to say. So this is simple. It's as simple as an entrance. So just like uh, Jesus compares salvation to drinking a glass of water or eating a piece of bread and you will never hunger, you will never thirst, you know, simple that just one lot of water you shall never thirst so this is very very simple okay now this is important because this is all setting the context of what it means to follow him and so the reason that i point that out there is because what what people like epiusion will do is they'll just take the word follow we'll see it means we've got to follow him and then they'll just pick all these other random bits around the bible that they think that's what that means for eternal life and we sort of touched upon that about how he's reading the bible bible like it's a conspiracy theory board rather than clear instructions now this is an isolated conversation that jesus is having with a particular group of individuals they don't necessarily know all of the things that he's been speaking to his disciples about about doing this and obeying his commandments and this that and the other they've got no background to that this is the conversation that they're having with jesus and jesus is saying enter the door and he shall be saved. Not enter the door and then come out with me when I lead the sheep out of the pasture and then we'll go down that road over there and then we'll go up there and you've got to follow me otherwise if you wander off a wolf will snatch you. That's, that's not being offered by this passage. Okay. And then building on the issue of entering the door and being saved, Jesus continues the theme of salvation by relating it to life, uh, which we assume means life everlasting here. So the thief comes not but to steal and kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And he's just said, enter the door, you shall find pasture. So if you want life, all you have to do is enter the door. That That's what, what it means to have life, okay? Um, this is another important bit in verse 11. I am the good shepherd, and I uh, give my life for the sheep, essentially. I'm sorry, I've just paraphrased it slightly there. But um, that's important because sometimes these work salvation types will bring up things like you've got to deny yourself and pick up your cross to be saved. Well, no, actually, Jesus went to the cross for our salvation. We don't go to our own cross for salvation. Otherwise, what did Jesus do it for? Jesus lays his life down for the sheep, for salvation anyway, okay? Now, Jesus then uses this uh, in verse 12, what Epiusium was, was talking about with the, with the wolf. So, he that is a hireling, somebody who's not the shepherd, who's owned the sheep or not. So, the sheep, the sheep don't belong to a hireling. He's just someone who's paid to do a job. Sees the wolf coming. And then it says he leaves the sheep and and flees. And then the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep and so that's where the wolf comes in so the wolf tries to devour the sheep the wolf tries to catch them which i believe in the bible translation that epiusion is reading it says snatch that we you know we could argue about semantics but snatch catches the wolf it seems to, to come for the sheep but because jesus is the good shepherd he's not going to allow the wolf to come okay so the wolf cannot get to the sheep because the, the good shepherd protects them. Now, Jesus doesn't really explain exactly who the hirelings represent. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily call them false messiahs or uh, false prophets necessarily because you might lump them under the category of the, the thieves that were trying to break into the sheepfold earlier in the chapter. But a hireling would be someone who presumably is supposed to do the same job as a shepherd, but doesn't fulfill all of his duties because he's he's just there for the salary. He doesn't actually care for the sheep. And so the point is that Jesus actually cares for the sheep. And he says that in, uh, he points that out, a hireling cares not for the sheep in 13. But once again, just in case you missed it before, Jesus is the good shepherd there, there in verse 14. And it says he knows his sheep, so I know my sheep and am known of mine. An emphasis on the word my. OK, because this is where conditional security is going to start to crumble once we can start to grasp this in light of the whole chapter, because the word my there, this my sheep, implies that there is a concept of owner 
ship. Okay. And this is going to be very important because although he's not mentioned the free will argument from what I could see in this video, that's something that a lot of conditional security folk bring up that you, you have the free will to, to wander away. And that, that's going to cause some problems in light of this chapter. So we'll, we'll revisit that in a moment. And just in case you missed it before, he again repeats himself that he lays down his life for the sheep. Okay, we don't surrender our life to Christ to be saved. He surrendered his life for our salvation, just to point that out. And then uh, the next verse, verse 16, I personally think this is more in reference to the uh, bringing in of the Gentiles. But uh, he goes on to say, there are other sheep that I have which are not of this fold that you must bring and bring them under one shepherd. But that, there's nothing out of that verse that, that we particularly need for, for what we're discussing here. And then verse 25 and 26 are very crucial here. Jesus answered, you believed not. So the people that he's talking to, they, they've seen the works that Jesus has done. Bearing in mind he's, he's doing the works. These works bear witness of him. So Jesus isn't just some random dude who comes along and says, look at me, everybody. I'm Christ. Just believe me because I say so. Like a lot of people with a Messiah complex have done throughout history. Uh, no, uh, the works that Jesus does actually bear witness of him. The people had seen his miracles. He displayed his works, but they did not believe. Well, why didn't they believe? You believe not because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So again, Epiusion Apologetics wants to follow, pick up on this word follow and make all this huge doctrine about the commandments and all the stuff that you've got to be doing to be saved. But no, because verse 26 answers the, the context of verse 27, that the sheep follow him because they believe. But the group that Jesus are talking to, they're not of his sheep because they don't believe. Okay, so that's who the sheep are that follow Jesus. So let the Bible be its own dictionary. The sheep that follow Jesus are the ones that see Jesus' works and believe him. And the ones that are not his sheep, they're the ones that don't believe him. It's not the sheep that are in the same pasture as the other sheep, but won't follow him when he commands them. That's not offered by this chapter. That, sh that, that type of a sheep is not hypothesized here at all. This chapter has only given us two types of sheep to work with. We have the sheep that follow the voice of the shepherd. They are my sheep, Jesus said. They believe him. They enter the door of the pasture. The, the second type of sheep are they that don't belong to Jesus, according to verse 26. They see his works, but they don't believe him. Now, Epiusion apologetics and people like him, essentially what they do is they create a third type of sheep, which is a sheep that belongs to Jesus for some reason. They had salvation at a time for, for whatever reason, but for them, for what other reason, doesn't follow his voice. And so because they don't follow his voice, they, they wander away and get, get devoured by the wolf. The problem with that, though, folks, is that Jesus has not hypothesized this type of sheep at all. There is no such sheep mentioned in this passage. We only have two types, the ones that follow the voice of the shepherd and the ones that don't. And the ones that don't are the ones that don't believe him. But the ones that do, all they have to do is enter into the door and they find pasture. It, it really is that simple. This is not complicated at all. The, there is nothing about the sheep doing all of his commandments and doing this, that and the other. Okay. And so then this sets up the context and the premise behind what he means by verse 28, that he gives them eternal life. So we're clearly dealing with eternal life here. This is not just something that's temporal. They shall never perish, right? And this is not, well, they, they shall never perish so long as they keep following me and don't stop following me. No, it just says they shall never perish. My sheep, I give them eternal life. They're his sheep. They belong to him. They have that belonging. It's very important that you understand that. And so no man shall pluck them out of his hand because they belong to, to him. His hand holds them. And then he repeats that essentially in verse 29, that uh, my father gave them me. Okay. And by the way, his father is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them from out of my father's hand. So there's uh, something going on there. They're holding onto what is theirs. 
So they are my sheep. He holds onto what belongs to him. They belong to the father. They belong to the son. So their hand holds onto the sheep because it's their sheep. It's their property. Okay. And so this is where conditional security just completely falls apart because they just, they don't understand this concept of ownership or how sheeping actually works. And though, well, you have free will to wander away. There are all sorts of problems with that argument. And so just re revisiting some points from earlier in the chapter then, this was one dimensional. The sheep hear and obey's voice. They simply do not follow a stranger's voice. The idea that sheep follow him for a bit and then stop following him and start looking around, that's not offered by this chapter at all. It's just not hypothesized. This is entirely one dimensional. His sheep follow him. It's as simple as that. So if these sheep were to wander away or if they're led by a stranger's voice, well then, According to this one-dimensional saying here, they're not his sheep by definition. And so someone who wanders from the faith, they don't lose their salvation. They were never saved because they did not follow the voice of the shepherd. They did not hear his voice. They wandered off. They were just trying to... They were among sheep in the pasture, but they weren't his sheep, though. Okay? Now, something then that the conditional security will say is, but God gave us free will. We can... We can choose to walk away. Well, again, this violates verse 14 because verse 14, it says that the good shepherd knows my sheep and I'm known of mine. Okay, there's ownership going on there. And all you have to do is just stop for five minutes and just use your brain to actually think about how having sheep actually works. So let's just stop and think about this logically. Okay, think about a sheep in a field. This box here, that's a field. Okay. Now, does a sheep have free will? Okay. Because remember, if we're going to use the free will argument that we can choose to walk away from Christ, well, well, does a sheep have free will? Well, it has some degree of free will. Okay. It's got a big field to wander around in. So we could walk up here. Okay. Or he could walk all the way over here. Or he could walk all the way over to the left. So yes, to an extent, the sheep can roam over here, roam over there, this, that, go around the place. But he's still confined to the limits of the field, okay? There's a reason why fields of sheep have walls and barbed fence around them, okay? The sheep is not supposed to be allowed to leave the field, all right? The, the, the gate, the wall, that's all there to keep the sheep. So yes, the sheep can go over here and go over there, but only within the confines that God has set, only within the field, okay? Now, in the real world of shepherding, at some point, this field, the grass is going to all be consumed by the sheep in it. So the shepherd is going to have to move the sheep into another pasture that's that's got more grass readily available for them to eat. OK, so the way that Epiusion framed his argument is that the shepherd's walking in the front and he's just walking forwards, not really care, caring what happens behind him. And so it's up to the sheep to then follow him but then if you wander away if you're not hearing the voice of the shepherd then a wolf will devour you this is this is the argument that he set up the problem with his argument though folks is that according to the way that that john's gospel actually frames it the wolf is not sat away somewhere waiting for stray sheep that he can devour later the wolf actually comes to the sheep and so that's why the shepherd has to protect them as opposed to a hireling, because that's what John chapter 10, te, uh, tw 10, 12 said. He that is a hireling and not the shepherd, who's owned the sheep or not, sees the wolf coming. So it's not that stray sheep are wandering off and, and then the wolf gets them later. The wolf is coming towards them where they are. Okay, and so a hireling would leave the sheep and, and flee, and then the wolf would catch them, not just one sheep, not one stray sheep, but all the sheep that belong to the shepherd. The wolf would get them. That's why Jesus is the good shepherd, because he's not going to allow that to happen. And so this is just this wolf that's out there waiting for whatever sheep happens to go astray. That's just simply not conceptualized by John chapter 10 at all. Okay, the closest thing that we have that might try and take the sheep is the stranger's voice or the thief, okay? So if there is a sheep that might wander off, well, then there's stranger danger. There's a stranger that's trying to lead that sheep astray. The problem with that, though, folks, is that we've dealt with absolutes in John's Gospel. So in verses 4 and 5, we have absolutes. His sheep go before him, um, the sheep follow him, and they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, 
but will flee from him. They know not the voice of strangers. There's no ifs here. This is an absolute statement. Jesus's sheep, his sheep, the ones that belong to him, they just simply don't follow a stranger's voice. It's as simple as that. And so while we're on the topic of absolutes here, it's important to point out that um, in, in some parts of the country where I live in Britain, there may be some areas of the country where sheep are not always fenced in particular. They have a bit more freedom to roam. And so different farmers may be neighbours to each other and their sheep get, get mixed up. So what they sometimes do is, and it's not necessarily unanimous practice, but they will dab their sheep with a bit of spray paint somewhere or some mark, some sort of indication so that they identify which sheep belong to them and which sheep belongs to their neighbour. So if there was ever a danger of sheep wandering away, they know what sheep are theirs, okay? Now, Epiusion tried to frame it where this shepherd is just walking in his own direction and the sheep have to follow him. And if they wander off, that's their fault. That's their problem. But that's not actually how shepherding works in the real world, because in the real world, sheep have value. It's cost money to raise the sheep. The shepherd's going to want to get some value for that sheep. So it's in his interest to keep the sheep. So you may have seen that a shepherd would have a crook. Now, nowadays, shepherds would probably have sheep dogs. They might have not had sheep dogs, perhaps in the time of the Bible, because the Jews would have considered them unclean, but they may have had hired servants. So yes, the shepherd would typically lead from the front, but because sheep, being sheep, do sort of wander off in uh, slight directions. That's why what they need to do is uh, keep around the sheep and create kind of a virtual fence, if you like, to ensure that the flock stays together. Okay, and that's today, that's where sheep dogs would come in. They're like a virtual fence. The goal is to keep all of the sheep following the shepherd. You don't just let them wander off. Okay, sheep are property. They actually have value. You have to keep the flock together. That's the goal. You don't just walk forwards and hope that some of them will make it. Okay, now then, what what if a sheep does wander off and doesn't listen to the voice of the shepherd? Well, we dealt with absolutes. John 10 has absolute statements. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. It's as simple as that. They follow me. I know them. There's no ifs or buts about that. That is an absolute statement. So using these markings as the example uh, to, to help illustrate this, the sheep that wanders off, well, it didn't listen to the voice of the shepherd. Well, then, according to John 10, it must not be a sheep. And with what we've just seen about shepherding, about keeping the flock together, if that sheep belonged to the shepherd, the shepherd would have gone across and would have brought it back. But the shepherd didn't do that. Now, why would the shepherd just let the sheep wander off like that? Well, it's quite simple. It's not his sheep. That sheep shouldn't have been in the pasture in the first place. It must belong to somebody else. Now, obviously, in a real scenario, you know, if he's a good neighbour, he'd try and restore it to his neighbour. But that's obviously completely irrelevant to this parable. So this idea that you can just walk away from salvation and then lose it. It's just not true because that's not how sheep ownership works. That's not how John chapter 10 portrays it. Epiusion has just invented his own type of sheep to get away from this inescapable biblical truth. If somebody wanders off, okay, if they wander away from the faith and they just completely apostatize, it's further evidence they were never the, the sheep of the shepherd to begin with because they simply did not hear his voice. And so how do we hear the uh, shepherd's voice how do we follow his voice what did the shepherd say well the shepherd said whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life epiusion says whosoever repents of his sins should not perish but have everlasting life that's the voice of a stranger the voice of the shepherd said i am the door by me if any man enter in he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture the voice of a stranger, Epiusion apologetic, says that salvation is a difficult path and if you don't endure to the bitter end, you will lose your salvation. Well, sorry, but that's not what the shepherd said. The shepherd said, I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. No ifs, no buts. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The voice of a stranger says, you can wander away if you don't follow his voice and then the wolf will devour you. Well, that's not how shepherding actually works. That's just simply the voice of a stranger speaking against what the voice of the good shepherd said. 
the good shepherd uh, says that the hireling sees the wolf coming okay the wolf is coming towards the sheep that's what the shepherd said epiusi on apologetics the voice of a stranger said that the wolf is out there somewhere waiting to devour any sheep that wander from the main flock well again the shepherd never mentioned that in john chapter 10 so you can see very clearly the voice of a shepherd versus the voice of a stranger so now you know what it means to follow him for eternal life now, another thing to pick up on what he said, he said that, well, if Christ says no man shall pluck you from out of his hand, that only refers to other men. It doesn't mean that you can't choose to walk away because you can't snatch yourself. That was the explanation he was trying to use. But really, all this is, is it's man-made carnal logic to go against what Jean, Jesus plainly said. But in any case, let, let's just entertain him. If somebody does depart from faith, well, the thing is, folks, something or someone lured that person away maybe it was sin maybe they listened to some false teaching by some false person so if they lost their salvation and chose to walk away they were still plucked from out of his hand because something plucked them away okay something lured them into that so again that that that's just carnal man-made logic that just just to try and dance around what jesus said so let's wrap up the issue of sheep then because people will then bring up Luke 15, the, the issue of the lost sheep, that the shepherd goes out for his sheep. So he makes the argument that a sheep, the, the one sheep that's left the hundred, it's someone who's lost. And so because they're lost, by definition, they're unsaved. And so uh, he then qualifies this with Luke 15, 7, that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner, which is he refers to as a sheep, who repents, turns back to Jesus. So he's framing this issue as the, the lost sheep as the sinner that needs to come back to Jesus. But again, this completely butchers how the Bible actually frames it if you go to source. So the way that Epiusion frames the, the lost sheep out of the hundred is that because it says one sinner that repents, there's more joy in heaven. He interprets this to mean that you need to return to the shepherd to get your salvation back. And once again, it just shows how he completely butchers what the Bible's actually saying and what Jesus actually says when he says these things, because th this has got nothing to do with the issue being discussed, okay? Jesus is not giving this parable, this example, to people that were once saved and lost their salvation, okay? That's just not what's happening here. So it's introduced in verse 1 that people drew near to Jesus and they were publicans and sinners, and they went to hear him. They went to listen to what he has to say. And the scribes and pharisees murmured at this saying that this man receives sinners and eats with them and so this is about what uh, jesus gave his parable okay now he says what man of you having a hundred sheep if he loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it okay and then when he uh, found it he lays on his shoulders rejoicing and when he comes home he calls together his friends and family saying rejoice with me for i have found my sheep which was lost okay so uh, this is not talking about this is not really relevant to believers losing their salvation because it's not really the the frame it's not really the manner in which jesus is using this parable he's using this parable to explain why He's preaching to the publicans and sinners and the Pharisees and scribes and murmuring about this. Okay, that's who we, that's what he's dealing with. Now, bear in mind, he's pointing to the scribes and uh, Pharisees who we know are wicked. And he says, even you, these wicked scribes and Pharisees, even they would go out for the lost sheep to find that sheep. But here's the premise of it, though. You would go out and get that sheep. Okay, if it was your sheep, you had a hundred and you lost one, you would go out and get it. Well, we saw that in John 10, Jesus is the good shepherd. So if even you, if even the f scribes and Pharisees would go out for a lost sheep, Jesus would definitely go out for it. And so here's the problem with saying that, well, you need to turn around and go back to Jesus to get your salvation back. You need to return to following him. Well, that's completely against what this parable says, because the whole premise of this parable is that you go out for the lost sheep. You go to them. They don't return to you. OK, so it just shows how he's completely buttering this. So it's not that the sheep come back to Jesus, Jesus goes out for the lost sheep, okay? And here, what it means is Jesus is reaching out to the sinners that would be saved. Because when we're dealing with John chapter 10, Jesus was speaking to Jews and they would not believe him, okay? They just, they would not accept his teaching, they saw his works and they still rejected him. Whereas the publicans and, and sinners would accept him. So when it says, uh, one sinner that repents, again, it does not say 
turns from all of his sins that he shall be saved. What does a sinner need to do to repent? How does a sinner accept Jesus? Well, we already saw this when we dealt with Epiusium's false understanding of repentance. It's Matthew 21 that Jesus said, the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom before you for they believed him, but you won't repent that you might believe him. So the Pharisees and scribes reject Jesus, the publicans and sinners accept Jesus. And so that's why he's going out preaching to the publicans and sinners to reach the lost, to reach those who would be saved. So I know it's a bit uh, strange that he uses this parable about leaving the 99, but he's using the parable to explain the point as to why he's reaching out to sinners. And these, these are people on the outside. They're not people who were in the flock and then left the flock and need to turn around and come back again. That's not what's being discussed here. It's the people on the outside who need to be invited in. It's the people that are yet to enter into the sheepfold. That's who he's going for. And even if it was that you could lose salvation in theory, uh, and you could wander away from the hundred sheep. Well, it quite clearly says that the you would uh, you would go out af after that which is lost. Well, the shepherd would. So again, this is not about sheep making a U-turn and walking back to the correct shepherd. The shepherd goes out for the sheep, perfectly consistent with John chapter ten. So everything that he said in this video is basically completely false. He completely butchers what the Bible actually says and how the Bible actually frames it. So uh, I'm just going to show you another video where he more or less does the same thing. And then what we'll probably do is go to John chapter 6 to really solidify this issue of one saved, always saved, and deal with falling away and what actually happens when somebody falls away. And then we can just look at other stuff where he just constantly gets it wrong. So very much like the previous video, this is another one that I want to look at, and he's titled this Beautiful Explanation of John 5.24 Refuting Osas. And this is probably the most common verse that he's confronted with. So it's truly, truly, I say unto you here that hears my word and believes on him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death uh, to life. I'm reading the, the King James across. But uh, so that's that's the verse that he's going to tackle. He's going to give some qualifying verses for a point that he's going to try and make. I'm not going to play all of that. I'll just summarize what he says towards the end of it for you. Um, but then I'm going to play some of this bit where he gives a visual illustration. And once again, pretty much the same with the sheep and the shepherd demonstration. His illustration doesn't match how the Bible actually frames it. It's completely convoluted and actually makes no sense. His illustration contradicts itself. It makes no sense. So have a look at these clips and then we'll we'll summarize at the end. I would say by far the number one verse that I get sent to me for people who support Once Saved, Always Saved is John 5, 24. In fact, I get it so much that I felt that I needed to do this video to explain this verse. Okay, so for those of you who are visual like me, I've got three different items here that represent three different things. First one, this is eternal life, okay? It says, the Bible says that God possesses eternal life so this is God the Father dash eternal life, okay? Then we have Jesus, the Word of God. The Bible represents Jesus in this illustration, and this represents the believer, okay? So now, Jesus says that I and, the Father, I and the Father are one. I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. The Father possesses eternal life, okay? And then it says that, God gives Jesus eternal life. So he puts eternal life in his son, Jesus. Now, where's the eternal life found? Eternal life is found in Jesus. See, we get the whole package. We don't just get eternal life, but we get the whole package. We get Jesus himself because why? He comes along and says, after he gets eternal life, he says, now I am the way, the truth, and the life. So the most amazing thing that happens is that Jesus doesn't just give you eternal life, but he gives you the entire package, okay? The entire package of himself is placed in the believer at faith, at, at belief, Jesus puts himself, which, where's the eternal life now? Well, I mean, you could say that, yes, the eternal life is in the believer. Yes, I mean, that, that wouldn't be wrong. You, you would not be incorrect 
whatsoever to say that. that. But more specifically, where is it? More specifically, it's still, it's still found in Jesus. See, right here. Jesus comes to live inside you. Now, yes, you have eternal life, but you have something way more beautiful than that. You get Jesus himself, who is eternal life. You see? It's, it's, it's always going to be eternal. Eternal life is still eternal life. No matter what, what happens, it's, it's still eternal life. The question is, if uh, the question isn't that it becomes temporary life or anything like that. The question now becomes, is it possible to grieve the Holy Spirit? Is it possible to quench the Holy Spirit? Is it possible to walk away from God? Because you see, when he puts his spirit inside you, Acts says that the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him, okay? So, yes, faith is, is the first. We, we get and dwell with the Holy Spirit, but then we're expected to obey him. He guides us. When he puts his Holy Spirit inside of us, we are then expected to be guided by him, okay? So he tells us which way to turn. He tells us, go this way, go that way, turn left, turn right, stop speed up he he's he's directing us he, he at least he, he should be directing us he calls the shots he's the lord of our lives now okay now now we can choose we can choose to walk away from jesus and then look at this what happens where's the eternal life well, guess what? It's still in Jesus. That doesn't change. The eternal life is in Jesus, or Jesus is eternal life. So the question is more, can you walk away from Jesus? If he's in you and guiding you, he says to follow me. Okay, so if he says to turn right, and there's a cliff up ahead, and you keep going, he says, listen, I'm going, this is where I'm going. Follow me, okay? I'm going right. Follow me. And you have that choice. You have that choice to be led by him and take that path to avoid going off the cliff. On the other hand, you can also choose not to follow him. You have that free will. But guess what? If Jesus is going over here and you're going this way, See, now you're walking in the flesh. This is why Paul says, do not walk in the flesh because that leads to death. But for those who are led by the Spirit, those are the sons of God. So, and so I'll just briefly summarize the argument that he framed from the Bible to, to then justify the illustration that he went on to use. So he quotes verses like, for example, Romans 6, 23, where it says the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then he goes on to uh, provide other verses like John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Uh, let's have a look through here. And then uh, he has authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all who, who I have given him. So the way that he's trying to frame the argument, again, this is more of it in me, in him, is that eternal life is something that sits inside of Christ. It's in Christ, but then Christ has to be in you for you to have that eternal life. But then if Christ is going one direction and you walk another direction, you've left Christ and so you've left that eternal life that's in him. That's the, the premise of how he's trying to frame this argument. And then further on, he goes to quote John 14, 15, 17, where it refers to the Holy Spirit dwelling in the disciples. That's what Jesus was uh, talking about with his disciples there. So he started off saying, if you love me, you, uh, you will keep my commandments. And then he goes on to say, um, the spirit dwells in you and will be in you. So then he goes on to explain in his video that it's not just that that eternal life piece of paper that he has sits inside of you and Christ is on the outside, but that Christ himself actually is in you, which is obviously, that is a biblical concept, but you know, the Bible says Christ in you. Uh, but the thing is, when he when he says it's really beautiful, he makes it sound like it's something so profound that hardly anybody knows this. So the thing is, we know from the Bible that Christ dwells in believers. That that's demonstrable, and really, it, it sounds amazingly profound. But 
really people are going to want you to clarify what that actually means because what does it mean Jesus is sitting inside of me like this does that mean well it's the Holy Spirit in you or is it just eternal life itself or what what is it what does that mean and so he's trying to make it out like it's this beautiful amazing explanation but for me it was kind of it ended on a cliffhanger okay I wanted some clarity as to what what the difference is between eternal life in you and actually Christ himself in you like what is the difference supposed to be because he's trying to frame it as if well if eternal life sits inside Christ but then you walk away from Christ and Christ is no longer in you you've lost eternal life because that sits inside of him but Christ did say I give on to them eternal life he didn't say I give them myself and as long as they hold on to me they will have that eternal life in me that's not how Christ actually framed it and so Christ giving himself well yes you can include the Holy Spirit in that but giving you eternal life is what Christ gives you that's what it means for him to get to give you the reason it's in him is because there is no salvation in any other name okay so he's trying to make it sound more weird or or somehow profound than it actually is and it, it's it's great that christ dwells in us obviously i'm not trying to downplay it or anything but it's just it's the way that he's trying to use it to then frame his argument now there is something to pick up at 15 minutes 24 in he says that the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him. And by obey him, he means do the commandments. Because he quoted John fourteen fifteen to 17, where Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then he goes on to say, uh, I will pray to the Father and he shall give you the comforter. And that's obviously referring to Holy Spirit. Now, the problem is, folks, is that because he's reading from the English shoddy version there, the way that that's translated in English, it says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Whereas the King James just says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So the King James makes it look like an instruction. Well, do you love me? Yes. No. Well, if yes, do my commandments. Whereas the English standard version is, it's definitive. As if, well, if you love me, you, you clearly will do my commandments. There's no question about it. So, uh, I'll show you why that, why that difference in translation is, but it's because the underlying word is, uh, it's future active so because it's in the future tense it's hard to convey that in english you know you you will do this in future because remember jesus in john 14 is talking to his disciples in a quiet conversation he's going to go to his death he's going to rise again and so the point that he's saying is if you love me you know after i'm departed keep my commandments keep this thing going essentially so it's it's clearly an instruction but it doesn't strictly say that the holy spirit will get, be given to those who do his commandments okay and actually the the proof text for who the holy spirit is given to is in john chapter 7 38 to 39 it says he that believes on me as the scripture has said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water but this spake he of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive so it's given to those that believe on him not those who obey his commandments okay it's just that as far as the disciples are concerned well jesus is going to give them the holy spirit but then he also tells them well if you love me and you are my disciples so you ought to love me keep my commandments okay and you know he tells his disciples to uh you know shepherd the the sheep of the flock and, and so on and so forth so part of the problem is that he has a, a bible that puts works back into the gospel but there you go so let's break down his uh, explanation of this uh, school bus demonstration so at 15 minutes and 46 in he goes on to say that jesus is telling you which way to turn so he says go this way go go that way left turn right stop etc so he's directing us so he's framing this illustration as if jesus is actually the driver of this vehicle jesus is in the driver's seat okay but then just a few seconds later he goes on to say that now we can choose we can choose to walk away from jesus and then look what happens and now he's not in the bus anymore this doesn't make any sense just just stop and think about this for a minute you you won't need to be a driver to understand this if you've never got your driver's license you can still understand this if jesus is in you holding eternal life and he framed this as something sitting inside a vehicle and he's saying go left stop go right well that vehicle cannot go in a different direction than the man who sat in it whatever the man inside does whatever the driver is doing if he turns the steering wheel left or he turns the steering wheel right or he presses his brakes or he presses his accelerator that vehicle is going to do exactly what the driver 
is telling it to do. It can't do any different. So this explanation dismantles itself already. Moreover, folks, I actually take the bus to go to church. So he framed Christ as if he's inside a bus and he's trying to get the bus to go one way, but the bus goes a different way. Well, I get on the bus, folks, and when I'm inside the bus, you see, when I go to church, the bus has to turn a corner so I can get off at the bus stop. But when I go to church, I actually need to be going along that road up there. Well, I lack the ability to just exit the bus mid-flow and go in my direction. I have to wait for the bus to turn a corner, get off at the bus stop, and emphasise the fact that I have to walk off the bus out of the front door, okay? I'm not a ghost. I don't just sort of vanish through the frame and carry on going in my direction. I have to willingly get off that vehicle, okay? So you can't frame it as, well, you can choose to walk away from him because according to your illustration, whoever's driving that vehicle, A, controls where it goes, and B, if he had to leave it and if he wanted to go in a different direction, he'd have to stop and he'd have to walk off. The vehicle doesn't leave him. He leaves his vehicle. So again, just like with the sheep, he he's invented this ridiculous explanation that goes completely against how the Bible actually frames how this works, okay? Well, we've already seen how this works, folks. It's my sheep hear and know my voice, and that's talking in absolutes. It's not, if they obey my voice, then they will be my sheep. It's just, my sheep hear and know my voice. That That's how the Bible frames it. Jesus himself said, I am the good shepherd, and a shepherd goes out for his lost sheep. It's not, well, the sheep's wandered off and that sheep needs to do an about turn, otherwise they will be lost. No, the shepherd goes out for that sheep. And the shepherd said, no man shall ever pluck them out of my hand. That's how Jesus framed it. But they they always want to come back with this, well, well you'll be free will, you can choose to walk away. Well, who would choose to walk away from eternal life for a start? We'll, we'll cover that when we get to John chapter 6. But, you know, I want a chapter and verse on that. I want a verse that says free will, lose, and salvation, or I will accept eternal life in place of salvation, in the same verse, in the same sentence. I'm yet to find one, folks. Post one if you find one. The sheep's free will are limited to that provided by the shepherd because that's how shepherding actually works. He gives them a field to walk in, but they can't just wander off and go wherever they like. Okay, That's not how owning sheep works. And if they do happen to wander, they get lost. Well, the good shepherd goes out for his sheep and will not let any be plucked from out of his hand. So you either trust Jesus to fulfill what he said he was going to fulfill or you don't. Now, something that maybe will help you with this is just understand the burden of responsibilities. Now, what is your responsibility? Well, yes, he told you to believe on him for eternal life. He did say, if you love me, keep my commandments and sin no more. He did say, abide in me. He did say, hold fast your faith until the end. But what is Christ's responsibility? Well, it's Christ's responsibility to give eternal life to those that believe. You don't maintain it by your obedience. He gives it, okay? It's Christ's responsibility to lose none that the Father gives him, okay? And again, we'll, we'll look at that in John chapter 6 momentarily. It's Christ's responsibility to go out for his lost sheep. It's Christ's responsibility to not let any be plucked from out of his hand, okay? That's the stuff that he said he's going to do, okay? So let's have a look at John chapter 6. Now, I have already done a video on my channel about the Gospel of John chapter 6, particularly in relation to salvation. So that's about two hours... Uh, 23 minutes long and the first half of the video deals with one saved uh, always saved versus conditional security the second half deals with the issue about the bread of life and communion which epuc own touches on but doesn't give a definitive view on what his position is so i'm not going to address the bread of life in this video we'll just address osas eternal security so you can find that there if you want a more detailed explanation i'm only going to really summarize in this video but John chapter 6 is a really good chapter to illustrate this point because normally a lot of people probably default to John chapter 10 as their proof about him not letting any be plucked from out of his hand. But as we've seen from Epusium, people will try and wiggle the way out of that and come up with their own man-made carnal logic to, to try and get around that. And I think although John chapter 6 is perhaps less detailed about this specific point, it does have something in it which, albeit short, I think is, is very inescapable because although it doesn't have the beautiful illustration that John chapter 10 gives us about the shepherd and the sheep, it does give us information about the transaction that actually takes place when somebody gets saved. And also it 
Later in the chapter, it deals with the issue of believers walking away, but the disciples that left Jesus. And so when someone wants to confront me about verses like falling from grace or uh, making shipwreck their faith or any, you know, whatever they might say about losing your salvation, well, all of those verses that you would confront me with, they can be answered through this chapter because this chapter holds the key to understanding all of that okay so i'll summarize it and then we'll do it in a diagram and I, I just think it's inescapable i think it's a lot harder to wiggle your way out of this than it is to wiggle your way out of chapter 10. so it's not necessary to go to the beginning of chapter 6 we can start from verse 24 but to give you a bit of background earlier in the chapter there was the story of the five loaves and the two fish so the people uh, from that story uh, they have found him they've come back to him and then Jesus answered them in, in verse 26, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. So at first they were making it more about their physical hunger, just trying to get fed. That seems to be what it looks like here. But then Jesus goes on to make it a conversation about life everlasting. So in verse 27, do not labor for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting uh, life. Okay, so this is clearly this chapter is going to be dealing with eternal uh, everlasting life that is the context of this chapter okay so you can't say that he's talking about some something else you can't just pick another passage that has nothing to do with eternal life specifically against what this passage says this passage is about eternal life okay it, it's the key subject matter now just as a side note here in regards to faith alone or faith plus works uh, there's a very interesting thing that comes out here in verse 28, because this group actually asked Jesus, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Now, Jesus told them to labor and uh, Epiusion and people like that would take that as to mean, well, there is some kind of work involved salvation. It must be faith plus works, but he doesn't say labor for everlasting life. That's not what he said. He said, labor for the meat which endures unto everlasting life. That's what he says. So if you, I've explained this in my John chapter six video, but if you're going to do any laboring at all, you can't work for salvation. But if you don't know whether you're saved, well, then you ought to be working to try and find out how to be saved. You know, finding out what the different viewpoints are, finding out what the Bible says, finding out what the gospel is. So he's telling them to seek that out, which is for everlasting life. OK, and so they're asking, well, what shall we do that we might do the works and um, works in relation to what? Well, it's, sorry, I think there's a motorcycle. Well, it's uh, works in relation to everlasting life, because that's what we're talking about here. So we're not talking about doing the works of a Christian or doing the works just, you know, as part of a church or whatever it might be. It's doing the works of God for everlasting life. Well, Jesus answered, he said, this is the work. And th there's that that little word there work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent and so why is this important well a POCM will take verses like if you love me keep my commandments and make that about everlasting life and what you have to do for salvation thing is though folks he's not really talking about everlasting life in the passage where he says that okay here we are talking about everlasting life this is a group of people that haven't even believed on him yet as far as we know and they're asking, well, what do we, how do we do this work? Will you believe on him? That's how you do the work, quote unquote, for everlasting life. And really, he, he's just trying to answer that point of work because we know obviously from elsewhere in the Bible that it is faith without works. And then further down in the chapter, this is where it gets super interesting. And this is where the heart of the matter really sets in. So Jesus starts talking about the bread of life. But I, again, I'm not, I'm not going to deal with that, as I said. And then he goes on to say in verse 37, all that the father gives me shall come to me and him that comes to me, watch what Jesus says here and not just what he says, but how he phrases it versus how else he could have said this verse. Okay. He says, I will in no wise cast out. So anyone who comes to Jesus and we understand that eternal life is the subject matter here. Okay. That's what he keeps talking about. Jesus will in no wise, which is an archaic way of saying under no circumstances, will he cast them out? Well, to be cast out, you have to be in. OK, otherwise that that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So the conditional security 
crowd will say that, well, Jesus will let you in, but you can walk out, though, you because you can choose to walk away from your salvation under their framework. Well, if that were the case, then Jesus has used a very poor choice of words here. Because he said, under no circumstances will I ever cast them out or, or boot them out, get rid of them. Okay, well, if conditional security is true, Jesus could have phrased this slightly differently so that nobody would be confused by what he means here. Okay, because look what he doesn't say. He does not say, I will in no wise deny entry. I will in no wise reject them. Now, the, NA, the NLT does say reject them, but the NLT, the not living translation, as I call it, might as well just have a big front cover that says, we believe in work salvation and you've got to work your way to heaven. They might, they, they've they just completely corrupted the word of God by putting reject because all the literal translations are going with cast out. And Jesus also doesn't say, I will in no wise turn them away. So if a conditional security advocate would look at 37 there and argue that that just means when you come to Jesus, he'll let you in, he won't turn you away. But once you're in, you can then walk away. Well, then you're making Jesus sound like a crazy person who said stupid things because he could have worded it any other way if that's what he really meant. But he didn't word it like that. He worded it as, I will in no wise cast them out, you know, eject them, throw them out of whatever, okay? That's what it actually says. That's the wording that Jesus chose to use, okay? So this is, again, just another example of where conditional security falls apart by making Jesus sound like he says stupid things. Now, immediately, if some conditional security person was listening to me right now, they'd be like, well, hang on a minute there. Don't play this trick with us. Because walking away from Jesus is not the same as being cast out. So, okay, Jesus is not casting you out for eternal life. You're walking away from eternal life. Well, that's going to be destroyed by uh, verse 39, but we'll revisit verse 39 momentarily because there's something about the transaction that takes place when a person that gets saved will help this make more sense, but we just need to go ahead a few verses and then come back to this for this to make sense. If you go down just a bit further to verse 44, okay, verse 44 really sets this in because what's going on here is what you might call a transaction okay a transaction takes place so verse 40, 44 says no man can come to me and obviously we're talking about eternal life because that's the the context of this chapter right now this is what jesus is talking about and he's using all the right language as well he says no man can come to me so we can take that as being synonymous with believing on the lord jesus christ okay except the father which has sent me draw him so the father's got to draw him and if the father draws him what happens look at the words that jesus uses well he says i will raise him up at the last day now that's a crucial ending to that verse because that's also how verses 39 and 40 end which is going to tie all that together so we've got that from verse 44 somebody comes to jesus somebody believes on the lord well the father must have drawn him that must have happened in order for it to work because except the father drawn him no man can come to him so that that must have happened somehow now i'm not going to get into an argument about choice and predestination all that stuff I'm, that, that's not relevant right now what's relevant is that transaction takes place and if that transaction takes place Jesus will raise that, that person up at the last day. That's what's going to happen. So now let's wind back to verses 39 and 40, okay? So then, let's wind back to 39, and it says, This is the Father's will which has sent me, that all of which the Father has given me. So we might say that that's synonymous with drawing. The, the Father has to draw someone to come to Jesus. So the Father is therefore, because the Father's done that, the Father is giving that person to Jesus. So when somebody believes and they get saved, the Father has drawn him, the Father gives him to Jesus. So that's all part of that transaction that we talked about. That has to take place, okay? Then watch what Jesus says about those that are given to him by the Father for everlasting life. He says, I should and watch these two words here, lose nothing. So there it is, folks. Those that come to Jesus, the Father has drawn them, the Father has given them to Jesus, and Jesus will lose 
nothing okay absolutely nothing and it, again eternal life is the context and then watch how this verse ends it ends the same way that verse 44 ended i should raise it up again at the last day so again this is all what happens you get saved jesus will raise you up at the last day we're dealing with once again the verses that we go to for faith alone and osas we are dealing with absolutes. It's not they might not, well, it could not, or, you know, he will raise them up at the last day. It's going to happen because Jesus will absolutely not lose anything. And this all jives perfectly with what we've been looking at in John chapter 10. Okay. Now then, just in case you're getting a bit confused with all the language that Jesus is using about the father drawing and the father giving and all those that come to me, what does all that mean, Jesus? Well, he just makes it perfectly simple in verse 40, where he uses non-complicated language. This is the will of him that sent me. So this is the father's will that everyone which sees the son and believes on him may have everlasting life. And if that happens, if they believe on him, I will raise him up at the last day. So you believe on Christ while the Father's drawing you in, giving you to Jesus, and Jesus will lose absolutely nothing. So then when someone wants to take, I will in no wise cast out and say, well, that just means Jesus won't throw you away, but you can still walk away. Well, if you can walk away, you have to accuse Jesus of either lying or failing when he says, I will lose nothing. Okay, now someone will try and trick you with, well, Jesus won't lose you, but you can still walk away because of your free will. Yeah, that, that translates as him losing you because he said he would raise you up at the last day. But if you've walked away, he's not going to raise you up at the last day when he said he would. So he has lost you. That's how that works. Okay, your dog could walk away from your house and go missing. Well, you have to put posters up everywhere. Well, guess what? You lost the dog. You can't say that the dog just wandered off on its own accord. You lost the dog because you're the owner of the dog. And Jesus is the shepherd who owns his sheep. That's how that works. Okay, so that that's there's no argument out of that. You cannot use free will and walking away to get out of that. And let me ask you a hypothetical question. I'm going to use some man-made logic here, okay, which obviously is not as solid, but let me just put this forth to you, okay? So I would say, well, what if somebody wants eternal life, they, they don't want to go to hell, they want to go to heaven, they want eternal life, but they don't want to give up absolutely all of their sins. They haven't walked away in the conventional sense because they still believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they still want to be saved but they're having a problem where they're, they're not letting go of their sin for some reason. Well, Epiusion would say, well, they obviously don't want eternal life because if they wanted it, they would repent of all their sins. But the thing is, though, in verse 40, Jesus didn't say, whosoever believeth on him and repenteth of his sins. The phrase repent of your sins verbatim never appears once in the Bible, okay? It just says believe on him. That's, oh, that's the prerequisite here. And Christ will raise him up at the last day. So what if he wants to be raised up at the last day, but he's still got some sin in his life? Well, according to the verses in this chapter that use that phrase, raise up at the last day, turning from your sins is not a requirement of it. It's not a, it's not a pre-given condition. So no, they haven't walked away in the conventional sense. So if you're going to say that their sins, they will lose their salvation because some of the verses that talk about falling away are sin issues. Well, then you really got no choice but to say that Jesus has to cast them out that's the only way around that because they can't stay if they if their sins can can lose their salvation well they're not walking away in the sense they still want jesus they still want this eternal life package but jesus can't allow sin into heaven well then he's got to push them out okay so if you imagine the sheep analogy with the shepherd well if there's a really naughty sheep that's causing a lot of problems the shepherd has to have it put down well well the sheep can still stay in the field with all the other sheep but the shepherd's going to have to deal with it well Jesus will not cast them out. So this is just completely inescapable. You you cannot get out of this at all. They'll try so hard to just weasel the way out of it. But all it, all it is, is they want to take this phrase where Jesus says, I will in no wise cast them out and I will lose nothing. And they basically have to accuse Jesus of either being a liar or a failure. It's one of those two. Either you think Jesus lied or he failed. You take your pick. Now, just while we're here before we move on, some, something very brief to address is where it says about the will of God in verses 39 to 40, because Epiusion and all of his ilk, they always love to 
Take Matthew 7.21, where it says, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. They love to take that verse and say, Well, see, you've got to be doing the will of God. You've got to be doing all the work for obeying his commandments, blah, blah, blah. Well, the problem is, is that if you actually read Matthew 7, uh, it's the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus doesn't actually define in that chapter what the will of God actually is. He says you've got to do the will of God for salvation, but he doesn't tell you what that involves. He doesn't tell you how to do the will of God. He just says that you have to do it. Well, John's gospel here is giving us the will of God for everlasting life. So according to verse 40, how do you do the will of God to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Well, it's simple. You believe on him and you have everlasting life. That's what it says. That's the will of God for salvation. Now, somewhere on his channel, I can't remember what the video was, but Epiusion tried to explain this away, as he always does, by referencing other verses in the New Testament that talk about doing the will of God, and there is some actual work or something that you've actually got to do. So uh, th there are various examples of that, but the thing is, is if you actually go and find out all of those verses, actually look at the reason why that is the will of God. And guess what? Everlasting life is not the reason why that's the will of God. So for example, somewhere in one of the books of Thessalonians, it talks about this is the will of God that you abstain from fornication. Well, why? Why is that the will of God? It's for your sanctification. Or you might think of First Peter chapter 2, where it says, for so this is the will of God, that in well-doing, well, what, in well-doing, that you might have everlasting life? Oh, wait, that's not what it says. It's that in well-doing, you might put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So yes, there are other things that are the will of God for, that you must do, but not for everlasting life, though. Okay, those are the will of God for some other reason not related to salvation. This right here, John chapter 6, this is the will of God for everlasting life, that to do the works of God, you believe on him. So again, perfectly simple, and that's why we believe faith alone. We don't just take the words believeth on him and see, well, there you go, full stop, case closed. No, there's more to it than that, folks, because we actually read the chapter in its context, and we're not just a bunch of idiots that don't know the Bible that he always tries to straw man us into being. And so further down in John chapter 6 then, and this is just an, another reason why John chapter 6 really just nails the doctrine of eternal security, because we've seen the inescapable verses from earlier in the chapter. Well, later in the chapter, we actually see examples of people who you might say fell away. And so not only does John chapter 6 solidify once saved, always saved, it even answers all of your objections to once saved, always saved. So have a look what happens. So many therefore of his disciples, and when it says disciples, obviously it doesn't mean the twelve, it means Jesus had other disciples outside of the twelve. So and it's not even these are not even ordinary believers. They're not just believers, disciples, okay, people who are following him. So the stakes are higher here, folks. And they're saying who can hear it? They they stumbled at his teaching. Okay, does this offend you? Uh, Jesus knew that his disciples murmured at it, it says in verse 61. Well, then look what happened. Jesus talked some more with them, and then look what happened in verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Now, that's obviously a literal statement. They walk no more with him. Jesus, it's, it's not being metaphorical or allegorical there when, it, you know, in some salvation context per se. But they walk no more with him. And so you could see these as Jesus' own disciples abandoning him, leaving him and walking no more with him. So and we see from the context that they're not accepting Jesus' teaching. They're stumbling at his teaching. And that's why they walk no more with him. So you might put these in the category of people who lost their salvation, quote unquote, under the, the conditional security model. Well, what does Jesus have to say about these people? Well, have a look what he says. So uh, in verse 63, it's the spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing, the words I speak, they are life. So the, the key of life is in Jesus' words there. Okay. And but, but watch this in verse 64. There are some of you that believe not. Why don't they believe? Well, they did believe and they stopped believing and they lost their salvation. Wrong. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him jesus already knew all the way from the beginning who did not believe him 
and who should betray him. He knew that these people were going to do this. So it's meaningless to say that they were temporarily saved until they lost it again, because the fact that Jesus knows from the beginning cancels that out. It cancels that period of time out. You can't say, well, you were saved yesterday, and if you would have died on your deathbed yesterday, you would have been saved, but you've lost your salvation today, so if you die on your deathbed today, you're not going to get saved. Well, the thing is, Jesus already knew from the beginning that you weren't going to die yesterday, and he knows from the beginning when you are going to die and what state you'll be in when you die. So to say that people are temporarily saved is stupid and meaningless because it makes Jesus sound like he doesn't know what's going on. But when we read here, we see that Jesus knows what's going on. And he's already said that he will lose nothing. So why are these people walking away from him if Jesus will lose nothing? Because Jesus already knew from the beginning that they believed not. And it's not that, well, they did believe and then they stopped believing because they apostatized. No, Jesus knew from the beginning they believed past tense not. They just didn't believe. Whatever belief they had was a fake belief. It was a vain belief. Okay, that's why they didn't get saved. Now look at the difference between someone who actually is saved and look at how they respond to Jesus' words, unlike these betrayers. Well, over in 68, Simon Peter answered him. Well, sorry, verse 67, Jesus said, will you also go away? And Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hadst the words of eternal life. I love that answer from Peter. That is probably one of the best answers in the whole Bible to any question. Where would we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. So all these imbeciles like Epiusion apologetics, well, you have free will, you can choose to walk away. Why would I choose that? Why would a born-again believer with the Holy Spirit living inside of him ever choose to walk away? Jesus has the words of eternal life. There is nowhere else to go, okay? So why do I stick around? Well, because there's nowhere else to go. I'm not going to go to Buddha because he doesn't have the words of everlasting life. So why would I leave Jesus and go to Buddha? I'm not going to go to Muhammad because he doesn't have the words of everlasting life. I'm not going to go to the Catholic Church because their fake version of Mary doesn't have the words of eternal life. And I'm not going to go to Epiusion and all his ilk with their repent of your sins to be saved and their surrender your life to Christ to be saved, which is found nowhere in the Bible, because they don't have the words of eternal life. Jesus has the words of eternal life, and it's whosoever believeth in him. That's the words of what he said, and his words have eternal life. There is nowhere else to go. And just in case you think maybe Peter wasn't saved or he wasn't quite sure, well, just look at what he says in verse 69. We believe and are sure that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You see, that's what a saved person looks like. That's what a person filled with the Spirit of God looks like, okay? That's the difference between somebody who's saved, and I mean that in the absolute literally sense of the word, versus somebody who's not saved. People that walk away, they they don't think that Jesus has the words of eternal life, because otherwise, where would they go? They know that there's nowhere else to go otherwise. And so, again, it's just these stupid people like Adam, who think that people with the Holy Ghost living inside of them want to walk away from eternal life. It's bizarre. Whatever happened to the new creature that's a new creation in Christ with the new mind that has the mind of Christ? Yes, I want to walk away from salvation. It's the sh the free will argument, the walking away argument. It's the stupidest argument ever. Okay. And so naturally, they're going to then try and gravitate to what about this verse? What about that verse? What about this, that and the other? And all these warnings in the New Testament about losing salvation. And of course, they don't have a verse that says lose everlasting life. It'll be something like they've fallen from grace or if someone was enlightened and tasted and they fell away, it's impossible to renew them again. Or, you know, you have made shipwreck your faith or this, that and the other. Well, all of those verses that they would ever turn to as their proof texts, they can all be answered through the lens of verse 64 right here. Well, what about those who fell from grace? Well, Jesus knew from the beginning who believed not. Well, what about those who were enlightened and partook of the Holy Ghost and, and then they fell away? Well, Jesus knew from the beginning who believed not. Well, what about the parable of the soul when uh, there's the type of seed that the, that fell on the ground and they're those that believed for a while and then ta some offense came and they fell away well yeah they believed for a while but jesus knew from the beginning who believed not so they still fall under the category of believed not okay and just in case verse 64 isn't clear enough for you uh john three eighteen shows this same point that he that believes on him is not condemned but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not 
up to now believed. So those that believed for a while, as the parable says, they still come under the category of has not believed. They believe not. You say, well, why Why would then Jesus use that parable? Well, the thing is, there is such thing in the Bible as believing in vain, like it says in 1 Corinthians 15. People have a vain belief. So that believer that you thought was saved and then they went off and did some grievous sin or went into some heresy and stopped believing or whatever it might be and you thought they lost their salvation. No, they didn't lose salvation. They were never saved because Jesus knew from the beginning that they did not believe and whatever belief they had, they believed in vain. Okay, this is not complicated, folks. And so all of his objection verses about losing salvation, they're all answered. They're all answered in this simple verse right here. This is not complicated at all, folks, to answer all of all of their objections now. So for those of you that are visual and uh, maybe would like to see this explained in a chart, well, here is time, this purple line. And let's imagine that above the line is saved onto eternal life and below the line is unsaved damnation. So this man uh, supposedly at least gets saved and he appears to be walking in the faith. And you can interpret that however you like. If, if you have a workspace salvation and you want to make that all about his obeying his commandments, fine whatever and then some point in his life happens he he falls away so he's one of the people that a conditional secure retard would say that he lost his salvation okay so what are the verses that they would turn to to say that this man lost his salvation okay well they'd they'd say about this man he was once enlightened he once tasted the heavenly gift he once partook of the holy ghost then he fell away as per hebrew 6 uh, they would say that he's the seed on the stony ground, that are those that believe for a while and then in time of temptation fall away, as per Luke chapter 8. Perhaps James, when he says, if any of you do err from the truth, he's one of those who erred from the truth. Uh, you might say he's one of those who fell from grace, as per Galatians 5. Or when Jesus said in John 15, if a man not, uh, abide not in me, he has cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gathered them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So he's one of those. He was he did not abide in Christ. He was cast forth as a branch. When he dies, he, he's going to hell. Uh, you might invoke Peter and say, for if we have, uh, sorry, sorry, if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord, our Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome and the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. So we could say this about this guy. It's worse for him than it was in the beginning. Uh, he might say having damnation because they cast off their first faith. Well, that's exactly what he did. He cast off his first faith. faith. He's just become a God-hating, rejecting reprobate at this point. So these are all the verses that they're going to turn to and say, well, he did believe for a while, but he lost his salvation. Well, what does Jesus have to say about it? Well, Jesus knew from the beginning who believed not. He that believes not is condemned because he has not believed. Well, how can we say he has not believed when the seed on the stony ground believed for a while? Well, it's quite simple. Let's get a bit of help from 1 Corinthians 15. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Well, what is vain? Well, vain is, in this context, it's pointless. It's a pointless belief. If that man would have believed with a saving faith, that father would have given him to Jesus and Jesus would lose nothing and Jesus would hold on to him and Jesus would go out for the lost. Well, why didn't Jesus do it for the man in this diagram? Well, it's simple. He believed in vain. He, he was not a legitimate believer. He never got saved. His, his faith did not work to the saving of the soul because if he would have believed Jesus, Jesus would fulfill what he said he would fulfill. But because Jesus didn't fulfill any of that, well, he doesn't owe this man anything because he was never Jesus to begin with. Perfectly simple when you can see it from Jesus' heavenly perspective. And so it, it pains me to have to explain something so basic that people just cannot grasp this, and it's so simple. If you can just understand that Jesus foreknows everything, this all makes perfect sense. There's, there's nothing complicated about this at all. So if, if we just take a timeline, a man was dead in sin, then he claimed to believe the gospel, and then he did grievous sin, and then he just, now he just outright rejects the truth and he'll never return to the faith again. He's just completely apostatized. Well, he didn't lose his salvation here, folks, because he never got saved here. It was a vain belief, because Jesus already knew that from the beginning that he would end up here. Jesus did not fulfill his obligations to lose nothing that the Father gave him, because this man, whoever this is, 
this man did not meet the criteria for Jesus to fulfill his obligations. You can't call Jesus a liar or a failure. So somewhere, somewhere along the line, this man failed somehow. Okay. So it's meaningless to say that, well, if he would have died round, round about here, he would have gone to heaven. But then because this happened and he died here, he then went to hell. So he was saved then, but then he lost it. That's meaningless because Jesus already knew this man's life. Jesus has already foreseen this. So if they want to argue, well, Jesus covers you for your past sins, but, you know, you might sin tomorrow and lose yourself. Well, Jesus already knows if I'm going to sin tomorrow or not. It's ridiculous, their logic. And they just, they just prove that they cannot understand spiritual things. because they, they want to throw out this argument. Me free will, me free will. What about the free will? What about your choice? Well, you know, Peter had free will and he said lord to whom shall we go you have the words of eternal life because peter understood there is nowhere else to go what what choice would he make you know what i know what jesus is like but i'm just going to choose to walk away and you know where would we go jesus has the words of eternal life and peter grasped that he didn't get he didn't get everything right all the time he made mistakes you know denying jesus three times but but he understood that though okay so this idea that somebody would would grasp eternal life and just choose to forfeit it is just completely contrary to the very nature of being born again, being a, a new creature in Christ with the mind of Christ. So that, that the free will argument to just try and prove conditional security by free will, which is not even a Bible verse anyway on that. All they just do is they just prove that they don't have a renewed mind because they cannot understand heavenly concepts such as this but but it wasn't even a difficult concept okay it's just it's it's difficult for the carnal mind and so their carnal logic is just a reflection of their carnal mind and their dead in sin nature and the thing is even if with the free will argument being granted let's just grant them that concession does that change the fact that jesus knew from the beginning who believes not because we go with the words of Jesus, we don't go with the carnal logic of some work salvation fool like Epiusio and Apologetics. So let's get back to the passage then. Um, I'm going to focus on this guy because this is not Epiusio and Apologetics, this is why City preaches, but he does hang around with Epiusio and Apologetics. They've gone into the streets screaming, repent of your sins at people. So they're, they're in fellowship with one another, okay? They're two peas in a pod. So... I'm I'm exposing him here, but indirectly that's exposing Epiusion as well because they're they're basically buddies. So he's gonna go go to the same chapter that we've been looking at. So we've been looking at John chapter six, and we saw that Jesus said, "I should lose nothing," and so he's then going to explain this away by explaining how Jesus will lose some. Okay, now for the sake of time, I'm not going to play all this. I'm just going to jump to certain time frames and we'll look at the transcripts on the right and we'll just summarize what we, what he said in this video. But you, you know what the video is. You, you can go there and see the evidence for yourself if you want the full evidence. So about three minutes in, he focuses on the parts of the passage where it says I should. Okay, Jesus says I should, not I will lose nothing. So let's just let's just have a look at this uh, a little bit closer. So what what people like him try to do is they they try and focus on the woulds and the shoulds and the coulds, and they make it as if it it might not happen. So Jesus says I should lose nothing, but that doesn't absolutely guarantee that he won't lose some because I, I should lose nothing, but not necessarily I will lose nothing. The problem with this is that that would only carry weight if Jesus constantly spoke like that all the time. Okay. But you know that there are parts of John's gospel where Jesus said something like this, like for example, uh, as he says in verse 40, he that believes on him may have everlasting life. So well, well he might not have everlasting life. But the problem with interpreting the Bible that way is that you then have to completely ignore the bits where Jesus did use absolutes. Like he said earlier in the in this very chapter, he says in verse 35, he who comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes on me shall never thirst. So we're dealing with absolutes there. And then two verses later, he says, I will in no wise cast out. So there's your wills, there's your your shalls. Those are the definites. And even though he said, um, I should raise it up at the last day there in verse 39, he then did go on to say in verse 40, I will raise him up at the last day. And so he that believes on him, I will raise him up at the last day. That's an absolute statement. 
And so in this video, he, he's honing in on the bit about the may have everlasting life and that it, it's conditional. But the condition is that you believe on him. Well, yeah, we agree that the condition is that you believe on him. But then he's going to set up a paradigm where somebody can believe on him to the point of being saved and then stop believing on him and then stop being saved. Well, we've already answered that, folks. The people in this chapter that Jesus is speaking to, there's some of his own disciples with him that then walk away. And Jesus knew from the beginning who believed not. Jesus already knew they believe not. So the prospect of somebody believing and then stop believing is already answered in John chapter 6. The same chapter that we're dealing with answers your objections to one saved, always saved and easy believism from this chapter. But when he then goes on to explain this, he's going to have to go to a different chapter in John to explain it because he couldn't explain it properly from this chapter. So have a, let's have a look what he says later on. So he then goes to John chapter 17 between verses 6 to 12. And this is where Jesus is praying for his disciples. And it goes on to explain that of those that the Father that you've given me, None of them is lost except the son of per perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. And so he's using that then as his argument that Judas Iscariot was saved at one time. That's what it says in the transcript script there. He had faith apparently at one time, but then there's a point where Judas lost his salvation. So Jesus had him, the father gave him to Jesus, but then Jesus lost him essentially is, is what his argument plays out here. So just to focus in on it, this is the verse in question, John seventeen twelve. Uh, Jesus is praying to the Father, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So there's that bit there, essentially, that they'll say, well, none of them is lost, but the son of perdition. And so what, what he's essentially arguing is that Jesus lost Judas somehow. Okay. Now, the problem with a verse like this, folks, is that it's rather ambiguous because Jesus isn't praying for the disciples' eternal life in this chapter. So when it says he lost Judas, that's not necessarily losing him insofar as his eternal life is concerned. Now, although why city preachers didn't use this, I have seen uh, Acts chapter 125 be used to, to show that Judas lost his eternal life. And this is one of their proof texts because it says that by transgression, he fell. But he doesn't say that he fell from eternal life or that he fell from salvation. It says he fell from his ministry and apostleship. That's what he fell from. OK, so just because Judas was lost doesn't necessarily mean that Jesus lost him as far as his eternal life is concerned. And so this is something, it's very specific in John 17 to the disciples. He's not praying for all believers here. Okay, so this is not about how he won't lose believers. It's specifically about the disciples. So he lost Judas as a disciple, but that was specifically for the reason given that the scripture might be fulfilled. It's, it's not to prove that you can lose salvation. It's because the scripture already prophesied that somebody would betray Jesus. And so that's why Jesus had Judas among him. Well, but we'll just park that for a moment. So even though we've got, so just have a look at this. So it says, you, uh, those that you have given me, I have kept, and there's a comma there. Okay. And then it says, and none of them is lost. And we've got another comma, but, but the son of perdition. Okay. So we've got two commas in the text, but be very careful with ambiguous verses like this, because where you put a mental comma, as I would call it in your head, when you're reading this, could actually change the meaning of this sentence. Okay, so just, just have a look at this for a second. So if I focused on the first comma, okay, so I would read it as, well, those that you gave me, I have kept. And then you would separate the sentence and say, well, none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, so that you would merge those two things together. Well, that makes it look like Jesus didn't lose the other 11, but he did lose the son of perdition. If you read it that way and you focus on the comma there. OK, but look what happens when you put your mental comma in the other one instead. So we can read this as though uh, those that you have given me, I have kept and continuing this same thought, by the way, none of them is lost. And then we've got a comma. OK, and then separately, we've got the next bit of the sentence, but the son of perdition. Well, reading it that way, then looks as if actually Jesus didn't lose any of the disciples. It's just that the son of perdition 
was lost. Okay, so it's not that Jesus lost him, he was already lost. And so you ask me, well, hang on a minute, aren't you playing kind of word games there? Aren't you trying to manipulate me there? Well, here's an idea. Rather than going all the way to John chapter 17, because we couldn't explain John chapter 6 properly, let's go back to John chapter 6 and let John chapter 6 explain itself. And while we're at it, it will also answer this verse for you right here. So let's just go back to John 6. Have a look at this. Bearing in mind, we've we've already looked at verse 64 in John. Okay, we saw that Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believe not. And watch this, who should betray him? Okay, Jesus knew from the beginning. This really isn't complicated, folks. Well, have a look then what goes on to this chapter. So we've already read this bit, but look how this chapter ends, because there's, there's extra verses at the chapter that we haven't got to yet. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Okay, it's not you will be a devil, one of you is a devil. I have chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. Okay, now what has he chosen for? He's chosen them specifically as his closest disciples. All right, it's not cho choosing them for eternal life because there's plenty of other people, and it's those that the Father gives him. Jesus doesn't personally choose; the Father gives them. That's how John chapter six has framed those that believe for eternal life. Now he's speaking specifically to his disciples. One of you is a devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. So. The, the narrator is explaining that Judas Iscariot is the one that should betray him. Well, we just saw Jesus knew from the beginning who should betray him. Jesus already knows this about Judas. But Captain Moore on here said that Judas, about seven minutes in, he says that Judas was once saved. Judas once had the faith. But Jesus already knew that Judas would betray him. Jesus already knew that he was false. So it's absolutely meaningless to say that, well, I would have given him eternal life. I just took it back from him because, you know, he kind of betrayed me. Jesus already knew that he was going to betray him. It's meaningless to say that Judas was temporarily saved. It's an utterly meaningless statement. And so Jesus said, I should lose nothing. Well, Judas was already lost because Jesus already knew that he was lost. This isn't complicated, folks. And John chapter 6 answers all of this. But he has to go to some vague verse, standalone alone verse in John chapter 17 that's not even dealing with eternal life specifically because he can't answer John chapter 6 properly. And so this is the logical progression of this guy's argument. Well, Jesus said he should lose nothing. He didn't say he will lose nothing, but we clearly see that Judas was lost. So we better maintain our own salvation because we can't really trust Jesus not to lose us. We, we better take it from here. I mean, folks, this is blasphemous, basically, what he's saying. He's saying that we can't trust Jesus to lose nothing. Now, just for the sake, just so I haven't left any stone unturned, why did Jesus use the words should lose nothing? couldn't he have just said i will lose nothing someone just in case somebody out there wants to wonder about that i'll deal with that for you right now okay ask this about yourself should you obey jesus's commandments should you obey the laws of god well the obvious answer is yes you should but have you done these things though folks because the bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god there is not a just man upon the earth who does good and sins not so yes you should do these things but guess what you haven't always done those things okay now ask this about jesus should jesus have gone to the cross should jesus have died for our sins well again the obvious answer is yes but here's the difference between you and jesus Jesus successfully did those things that he fulfilled he said he was going to do. He did those things. He fulfilled what he was sent out to do, right? You didn't. So in conclusion then, you should obey the commandments of Jesus, but you've already proven that you failed. Jesus should lose nothing that the Father gives him, but he's already proven that he will succeed. So either Jesus is going to lose nothing, as he said he would do, or you make Jesus a liar, or you make Jesus a failure. And that guy makes Jesus a failure. And so, you know, folks, we started off with Dumb and Dumber, and now we're on to the Three Stooges. It, it just gets more and more embarrassing the more we deal with their false doctrine. Just while I'm on this issue of the Three Stooges, let me just expose one more idiot to complete my collection, okay? Because this is another idiot that EPUC on Apologetics likes to fellowship with. This is Hal Chaffee, and he did a video about Ravi Zacharias and all, all the stuff that came out with that, with all the sexual abuse scandals and stuff. And the danger of one saved, always saved. You know, it's so dangerous about this Ravi Zacharias guy that he did all these wicked sexual abuse scandals, and yet all these OSAS folk saying that he kept his salvation. 
Well, here's an article about some of the witnesses that spoke against Ravi Zacharias. And here's one woman reporting that uh, he warned her not to even speak out against him or she would be responsible for millions of souls whose salvation would be lost if his reputation was damaged. So if that's true and Ravi really said that to this woman, well, that means he believed that he could lose his salvation. So that's why he was unsaved, because he believed that. So once, once saved, always saved is not the danger here, folks, because the guy he's exposing believed in conditional security. And just as a little side cookie for you, I'll give you this one for free. Here's a video where Ravi Zacharias actually explains the gospel. Have a guess how many times he actually mentions the death, burial and res resurrection of Christ. It's a big fat zero. It's all this fluffy stuff about repairing our relationship and all these words that Jesus never actually uses. There's nothing about believing on him for eternal life. It it's just all fluffy surface philosophical stuff. This guy was not saved. So no, Osas isn't the danger. False prophets are the danger. And it just so happens that false prophets believe in conditional security. Take it or leave it. So now that I've got my complete collection, I can release my new Bollywood film called The Four Idiots. You can find it out somewhere. I'm sure it's going to be a kicker. So there you go. So now that we've got one saved, always saved out of the way, and I do intend to deal with some of the more difficult passages that they bring up, like John 15. But before I get on to some of the more difficult stuff uh, like that, I want to tackle Faith Alone next. And I think once we've tackled Faith Alone then we've dealt with one saved, always saved, we've dealt with faith alone, then we can cover some of the, the difficult passages that he might throw, which, which seems to undermine a lot of Osas and faith alone at first sight. So I was kind of wondering what how's best to start this, I wasn't quite sure, so I'm just going to pick something and I'll just work my way from there. So I'm going to start with this idea about salvation being a path and not just a one-time event, because when when you read it in John's Gospel, particularly in the first few chapters, it seems pretty instantaneous. Like Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well, you, you drink the water that I give you and you'll never thirst again. Eat the bread that I give you, you will never hunger again. He uses a lot of instantaneous language. And whosoever believes on me is passed from death onto life, that kind of thing. So John's gospel makes it look very instantaneous. He's going to argue that it's a path based on uh, Matthew chapter 7. Okay. But I'm not going to play all of this just because my video up to now has gone on for so long and I, I just want to get through stuff. So I'm going to talk you through uh, the, the timeline of what he's saying, basically. This is a, a well-known scripture that they that he, he's going to use. So it's Matthew chapter 7 and between verses 13 to 14, Jesus says, Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leads on to life, and few there be that find it. Now, just as a side comment, because he reads the English shoddy version, his Bible doesn't actually say narrow is the way, it says hard is the way that leads to life. And uh, the New King James, by the way, also says difficult is the way to life. So it's not that the way is narrow, it's that it, it's, it's difficult. Now, part of the reason why that is, as far as I understand it, and as I've said before on this channel, I don't speak Greek, so this is all just based on secondary information. Let's see if I can find it here. It's based on this word here in, in the Greek. So it, it can mean narrow, but more in terms of like pressure, like kind of a squeezing in or, or constricting in some way. So it's kind of complicated to translate it to English because to us, difficult and narrow were obviously not the same thing but but you can understand if something's constricting or pressing against you you can see why it would be narrow in a sense and so we'll, we'll talk in a minute about you know which, which is the correct translation when it comes into english so he's trying to give this illustration of, of the narrow path and he's obviously he's in the woods he's on a very uh, small narrow path there uh, if you're not in this immediate area it probably wouldn't be very easy to see that narrow path um, and he comes up with all the same talking points that we've heard before, that this is a, a difficult path, that we have free will, we have a choice, so we can either choose to walk this narrow path or we, we can choose to walk the wide gate to destruction, essentially. And so about a minute and 24 in, he then tries to illustrate that the narrow path contrasted with the, the broad path that leads to destruction. So he's on the narrow path here, and just after this, he's going to pan the camera so that he's looking more towards the, that's the wide, straight path. That's obviously the, the easy path, as he would call it. Um, it. It's obviously a lot more straightforward there. 
and then uh, so he's carrying on the the narrow path as we can see in the uh, video timeline but then there is also the the wide path as well okay so this is this is kind of the illustration that he's trying trying to to give here and once again as as i've already pointed out with some of his previous illustrations his illustrations don't work with how the Bible actually frames it, or just common sense if you actually try and think it through. So think about this is that he's on the narrow path, and you've got to be careful to choose this path, and not by your free will walk off this path and go down that path, because that path leads to destruction, and that's the narrow path that leads to life. And yet again, folks, this is why his illustrations don't work. Because so far, at least from this particular camera angle that he's showing, these paths, the wide path and the narrow path, look as if they're parallel. They're going in the same direction, which means if you can just hop between them, you, you're you still going to the same place. So if it's all about free will and we need to be careful to go in the narrow path, well, you could just follow the easy path right up until the point where you realise it goes in a different direction and then just walk up here and then go the narrow path for the rest of it. That doesn't work. That doesn't make any sense. Because just as you could choose by your free will to stray from this path and go on that path, well, you can do the opposite. So because he's always trying to frame it as if faith alone and one saved always saved is giving people like a licence to sin. Of course, he's sinning without a licence. But, well, the thing is, this does the same thing. You could just walk down this path, do all of the sins and do what you want. And then as soon as you see that this path is diverging from that path, it will just hop across and then go on the narrow path just like that. And then not even you, you haven't even had to walk the difficult walk that he says we've got to walk. But then later in his video at 1 minute 55, the narrow path and the straight and the big wide path meet up together. So the destination is still the same. This doesn't work with how these verses are actually framing it. So let, let me show you how the verses are actually framing it. Okay, so let, let's have a look at the verses again. So we've got broad is the way, the road, if you like, that leads to destruction. So that's where the broad road is going. Okay, that's the, the direction. That's the place that that broad road is going to take you. And then it says narrow is the way, or difficult, as his Bible would tell him, that leads on to life. So that leads onto life. They're not parallel. They don't meet up together again. They're going in two different directions. One's going to destruction. One's going to life. Two different directions. Okay. And so here it is in illustration, folks. The wide path going to destruction and the narrow path going to life. Okay. And few there be that find it. So here's the thing. He's trying to make it out as if at any time you can just by your free will jump ship between the narrow path and the wide path. Now, his illustration didn't work because both of these paths go to the same place and they run parallel, but that's not what the Bible said. The Bible said one goes to destruction, one goes to life. And really, you can argue these are complete opposite directions, really, or they've got to be two different directions for this explanation that Jesus is giving to walk, okay? So this hopping between the two doesn't work. So you've got a choice. Either we go this way, we take the narrow path, or we take the wide path. Now, naturally, if, if this was a literal scenario, man's natural inclination is to go down the wide path. This looks like a normal road that you would want to walk down. Not many people would take the narrow path. Now, there's the odd adventure and the hiker that wants to take the more challenging path, obviously, but most people will, will take the wide path. And I, I, I like to go walking from time to time. Uh, not far from where I live, just an hour's bus ride away, there's, there's some really beautiful areas that you can go for walks on. And there's, there's a particular place where there's a wide path like this, and it, it used to be a rail line, but the rail was stripped out and it was turned into just a really wide pedestrian and cycling path. So a lot of people like to go down there cycling, walking, and it's, it's not busy like a city path, but it's busy in that there's more than enough people on that path. You're going to cross quite a lot of people if you, t if you take that road. Now, elsewhere, there's these narrow little paths that go down farmlands and go between hedges. Now, there is the odd time when you do bump into somebody on those paths, but they're not very busy. There's not a lot of people choosing that path. Most people, even when they're going out for a day in the country, still like to use the wide path with the tarmac and, you know, it's nice and straight and it's a lot easier to cycle and it's a lot easier to take the kids for a walk or for a bike ride. So that's what most people choose. That's their natural inclination to take the wide path. Not many people would choose this path, okay? 
But let's just say that you're someone who's taken this path. So in biblical terms, you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You've entered the path to life. OK, well, then you start walking down this path. OK, and so you're walking, you're walking, you're walking. Well, eventually you're going to get to a point where it's actually easier to go to life than it is to change your mind and go all the way over here because these paths lead in different directions and even to turn back and go the wide path is longer and more strenuous than just completing the journey okay so if you were to argue that the narrow path is difficult well you could get killed by a bear along the way or something like that well there's still a point where you've actually gone so far in it's more difficult to change your mind and turn around and go the other way than it is to complete what you started. So the illustration that you just hop between the two doesn't work if you actually understand how taking roads and paths in different directions actually works. His illustration simply doesn't work. So then, is the problem that the narrow path is too difficult and most people are going to turn around and go that way or, or cross over and do that? Or is it just that it's narrow and there aren't going to be many people that, that choose this path? Well, first of all, the illustration ought to tell that for you anyway, need I say any more. But let, let's have a look at what the Bible actually said. So in order to figure this out, folks, guess what? You don't need to understand the complexities of the Greek language to figure this out. You don't need to know Greek to understand which Bible is translating this right. Even in English, the context of the verse proves that the King James translation is correct to say narrow. It's narrow. It's not difficult. OK, and here's why. Look at the words that Jesus said. He did not say, few there be that walk down it, few there be that make it to the end, few there be that fight through the thorns and the thistles, few there be that won't turn back the other way, few there be that won't leave the road and take the easier path, or few there be that won't be killed by a wolf on the way. Jesus didn't say anything like that. What did Jesus say in verse 14? He said, few there be that find it. So just as not many people would choose to take the narrow path, not many people are going to find it. So the problem isn't that it's so difficult that everybody just keeps turning around and losing their salvation and walking away because they just can't hack this difficult path. Few, few can find this path. Because once you've found the path to life, I don't really know how to complete that sentence for you folks. You've found it. Case closed. That's the end of it. That's as far as Jesus takes this illustration. So, no, salvation is not difficult. Finding the path to life is the difficult bit. Once you've found it, you've found it. Case closed. So, his illustration doesn't work. It goes completely against how Jesus actually frames this. And so, this is just the embarrassment of those who believe in faith plus works for salvation. This is this is the crap that they come up with. They can't understand the words of Jesus and he's not even being profound or complicated in what he's saying. So folks, with all that said and done, what this shows is that if he can't even understand this simple two verse analogy that Jesus uses about two different roads, he, he can't even grasp that simple concept. How do you think it's going to work out when he tries to use all these complicated passages like John chapter 15 and James chapter 2 and, and so on? Because he acts like he's so smart with those passages, like he's got us and he's destroyed faith alone and we, you know, we can't answer these kind of things. He can't even answer something so basic. He can't even understand a basic analogy. But then he wants to act like it's a gotcha with all of these difficult passages in the Bible. It, it only just carries on getting worse from here, folks, than it's already going to get. So the next thing is, let, let's deal with the works issue. OK, I'll, I'll get on to James chapter two a little bit later. But, but for right now, let, let's deal with this faith and works issue and what he actually believes about works for salvation. So the next thing to deal with then is the distinction between what he calls the works of the law versus the works of Christ. So because he has a works based salvation and we have these passages where Paul talks about not being justified by the law and uh, being saved by grace through faith without the deeds of the law well he then has to explain what paul means there if he has a works-based salvation obviously so what he will explain in this video is that the works of the mosaic law such as circumcision 
they're what Paul is talking about when Paul talks about not being justified by the law. But then, because we have these verses about obeying the law of Christ or fulfilling Christ's law, that we're supposed to follow Christ's commandments. So you can't work for, for the Mosaic law such as by doing circumcision for salvation. Salvation must be completely apart from that. But you must do the works of Christ. So loving your neighbour, loving the Lord your God, all that kind of thing. So let's just skim through the uh, transcript just to just get a flavour of, of how he's justifying this. First, he points out from Galatians 3 where, where Paul says that all who uh, are under the works of the law are under a curse. So you're cursed if you rely on the works of the the law, by which Epiusion is interpreting the, the Mosaic law here. So no one can be justified before God by that, that law. Uh, the righteous shall live by faith. And so then in Galatians 5, he'll point out a little bit later that um, Paul deals with the circumcision issue that a lot of people thought that they could be justified by getting circumcision. And so that's what's meant by the law. You can't be justified by getting circumcised uh, for your righteousness. And then uh, a couple of minutes later, he'll point to Galatians 6, 2, where it says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill ye the law of, of Christ. And then he's explaining here in the transcript that he's just been explaining everything about not being justified by the law. But then here there's, there's the law of Christ that we have to fulfill. And, and so which, which is it is essentially is what he's trying to answer. So then how he's trying to justify that is not to put yourself under the old covenant or the Old Testament law, but instead you should be under the new covenant or the new testament law okay so fulfilling the law of christ is fulfilling new testament law or new covenant law you're not fulfilling old covenant law so old covenant law would be things like circumcision new testament law he's going to go on to explain loving the lord your god loving your neighbor etc etc and so then uh, he points to galatians 5 6 where in christ jesus uh, neither circumcision or uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. And so he he's then says in the transcript that love is the new law and loving God and, and loving others uh, in Corinthians, he also references as well. So these are the kind of laws that are new covenant laws, New Testament laws, and they're the kind of laws that we should be following for salvation, for our righteousness. And as they, as they always like to point out, John fourteen fifteen, if you love me, keep you will keep my commandments. Notice it doesn't say if you want to be saved, keep my commandments. If you love me, but there you go. So we don't get circumcised. That's not the works that we do for salvation. But loving the Lord your God, loving your neighbour, turning from all of your sins, by extension of what he says in other videos, that's fulfilling the the law of Christ, the new covenant law, and that's the law that we do have to fulfil for salvation. Okay. Here's where that argument is going to fall apart. And, and this is, again, what we dealt with earlier in this study, where his own arguments debunk themselves. It, it's strange. Like, he contradicts himself. He proves himself wrong. He exposes and refutes himself. So in another video, he talks about justification. Is it by faith? Uh, is it by works or faith alone? Or faith and works? That That's, again, where he's going to argue for all of the works. And here's a good one where he references a conversation that Jesus has with a lawyer in Luke chapter 10. So I am actually going to play this clip for you. So have a look at this clip. There was a lawyer that came up to Jesus and he tried to put him to the test. And he asked him, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And this is a great question. What shall we do? What do we need to do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus responds to him and says, all you have to do is have faith alone. No, friends, that's not what he said. That's not what he said at all. Listen to this. He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. And he said to him, this is absolutely insulting. You cannot earn your salvation. Who do you think you are? No, he actually said, you have answered correctly. This is the right answer. That's what he told him. He said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. You'll have eternal life. This would have been the perfect time for him to say, all you have to do is believe in a few facts about me. That's it faith alone. You don't have to do anything. But he said, no, do this. Oh, this is so embarrassing, folks. This is just tragic.
So you heard all of the arguments there, folks. Why didn't Jesus tell the lawyer to believe on him? You know, Jesus basically tells him, obey the commandments and you shall live. And what's it's just so moronic that he takes that as a statement to mean, if you, you must do these things for eternal life, as opposed to, well, everybody falls short of this standard. You see, the lawyer here, it, it specifically says, and it's no accident that the narrator is telling us this, by the way, that the lawyer stood up to him to test, or, well, the King James says to tempt him. So it's not that, well, this lawyer was curious and he wanted to be saved and he asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? This lawyer is not a humble person that wants to know how to have eternal life. He's trying to tempt Jesus. So the narrator here is setting us up for the reason why Jesus says these things. Now, we've just heard from our works of the law video, his works of the law video here, all this spiel about how we don't follow the Old Testament law, we follow, you know, New Testament law, and it's this new commandment about loving God and loving your neighbour. Well, hang on a minute, because Jesus says to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Okay. And the lawyer answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. So this is, he says this to Jesus, and Jesus says to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. Now, what law is the lawyer reading there? He's not reading New Testament law, folks. He's reading the Old Testament law. Those commandments actually come from the Old Testament. You see, when, when he says, you shall love the Lord uh, your God with all your heart and all your soul, he's quoting Deuteronomy. 6 5 an old testament law okay and when he says love your neighbor as yourself again he's quoting an old testament law leviticus nineteen eighteen. so if we have to love the lord our god and love our neighbor as ourself for salvation okay that's the love that we need to work for salvation you have to follow the old testament law this there is no new testament law that's different from the old testament law it's quoting the Old Testament. It's an Old Testament law that he quotes in Galatians as some kind of New Testament revelation from Christ. This isn't something new that Christ came up with in the New Testament. It's always been around in the Old Testament. And he's not the only person that's come up with this false dichotomy. Even Calvinists in the past I've dealt with have come up with this false dichotomy of faith of works, sorry, works of faith, I mean, versus works of the law, how we still need works of faith. But all the works of faith that you claim we need, a lot of them are quoting Old Testament law. So you have to then fulfill the Old Testament law by your logic. This idea that there's a different law for the New Testament to be saved doesn't work. It does not work. You're just fulfilling the Old Testament law. So there really, really is only two camps. Either you're justified by the works of the law, testament, whatever testament you're in, it's the works of the law, or you're justified by faith. It's one or the other. It's not both. Okay. So he's debunked his own argument. And anybody that understands the whole Bible would look at that and say, okay, if I love the Lord my God with all my heart and all my strength, and I love my neighbour as myself, and if I do these things, I will live, and they're Old Testament laws, so I have to obey those laws in order to live. Well, here's the problem with that. Paul is then going to explain how nobody has obeyed the law for salvation. That's why we're not justified by the law, because all fall short of the glory of God. There is not a just man upon the earth. Why? Because everybody has broken God's law. And even in his other video where he talks about returning from all of your sins to be saved, well, sin is the transgression of the law, the Bible says. So to turn from your sins, you have to obey the law. So everything that he said in this works of the law video is a lie. He lied against what he, what his own beliefs. He made a false dichotomy between Old Testament and New Testament works that doesn't exist. He's just lied out of his mouth and put words in that Jesus and Paul never actually said. So, you know, every time I listen to this guy, it's just, it's like a parody because he, he just debunks himself. He refutes his, his self. It's like he's exposing himself as a false prophet. It's just, it's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. The, the, this is what these unsaved people are like. They refute their own arguments. Okay. They, they debunk themselves. They prove themselves wrong and their, all their foundations are just built on the sand. And it's just, it's just a house of cards that's just ready to tumble. And so, you know, he just constantly embarrasses himself. And so all these verses are, no, see, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. Well, yeah, you have got to do that. But you're not going to be saved because you do those things. And it's like, the, that it's not that complicated, folks. Okay. And, and so, look, anybody that's listened this far, I just hope somebody out there will just grasp this for one miserable day. Okay. 
you know, you've got John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then you've got verses like John fourteen fifteen, if you will love me, keep my commandments. Well, okay. So to be saved unto eternal life, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but don't keep the commandments for it though. But then to show that you will love Jesus, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, yeah, then keep the commandments and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But look, stop conflating these two things. Stop mixing these two things. And let me just give you a good good illustration of this from the Bible, okay? Now, this is not a proof text. It doesn't prove anything that I'm saying, but it's a good illustration, okay? Deuteronomy 22.11, there's a law that says, You shall not wear a garment of diverse sorts, as of woolen and linen together. So what the law essentially says is, don't make clothing that's made out of both wool and linen. Either make something that's wool or make something that's linen. Now, there's nothing wrong with a woolen garment. It's a, it's a perfectly good garment as any other. There's nothing wrong with a linen garment. Again, it's a perfectly fine material to make clothing out of. So you can make clothing out of wool. You can make clothing out of linen. Both of those materials are fine to use for clothing. But don't mix them together, okay? That which is wool is wool, and that which is linen is linen, okay? That which is spirit is spirit, that which is flesh is flesh. Don't mix the flesh and the spirit. Don't mix your obedience with your faith to be saved, okay? So with all of that out of the way, folks, I think it's time to move on to some of the more difficult stuff now. Um, we'll sort of wrap this up by, I'll, I'll go through some of the difficult passages that he brings up, um, things like James 2, things like some of what he says about Galatians, John 15, maybe a bit of Revelation, and I'll see what I can get through. I know this video has already gone on for so long now, so we will spend a fair bit of time on this, but hopefully that, that will, this will be the last chapter before we really bring things to a close, because then at least if for anybody out there that would wonder, I, I've dealt with it, okay? Obviously, I can't deal with absolutely everything with what he says, but a lot of what he says can just be filed under other stuff that I've said. So all the stuff that he says about how you must be doing this and you must be doing that and this, that and the other. Well, we can file that under what we've just said about separating, keeping his commandments versus believing on him for salvation. Okay.